um, sewing some of the crossbones on. So I'm going to carry on with that tonight. And uh, some of the crossbones on. So okay, sound works. And bring this up. I'd like to see the chat. And we're good to go. So let me get my uh, get my tools. And I got my tools here. Going to get a flag, and we're going to get back to stitch. I'm just going to carry on right where I was, which was kind of in the middle of. Uh, one of the bones. Oh, cancel. I don't want to use that. What is that? Let's bring this up. You want to get my flag. So here is what it looks like. I think you can see that. But so far, so good. It's kind of cool. And it's on, I'm doing it on both sides at the same time. So it looks pretty cool. Okay, so we got our set up here. Scout, you can help me. It's my uh, tailor's assistant, Scout. So somewhere around here is the last stitch I put in. I'll find that, and we'll just carry on from there. Okay, it's right here. So uh, this is one. This uh, red flag is one of the last two real pirate flags that, uh, that that are known to exist in the world. This was captured off the Barbary Pirates, I think in 1780 by the British Navy, Lieutenant Curry took it. And uh, what's neat about this one, this isn't the one I'm copying, the one I'm copying, this, although this is a really cool design, um, <coughs> I'm doing a different design, which I'll bring up in a second. But the uh, traditionally, uh, a red flag meant no quarter or no mercy. So if, uh, if they, uh, you know, the merchant or whomever was the target of the pirates refused to uh, yield and they you know, maybe would threaten them with this but if, you know, if they're flying the, uh, the red flag uh, they expect no quarter and they will give no quarter. Um, this is the flag that I'm copying. Um, it's tan now because the, the, uh, apparently it all faded out. They, they say this was all black before um, so maybe it was a really fugitive dye but um, kind of looks cool gold I think but you know, you're hoisting the black flag, so we're making a black flag. Um, this one. And uh, so far, this is all hand stitched, and I mean, it'll, it's going to be entirely hand stitched. It's, that's you now I'm doing it. Um, and uh, I've got a little more than, well, I'd say I'm about halfway done with this bone. And then uh, I've got the, uh, the other bones cut out over there on the. Uh, on the table behind me, so I'm going to get to them in a little bit. But for now, let's see here. Let's just bring this up to. Well, I know what this is going to. Look. You know, what? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do full screen preview, and then I can kind of refer to this. And plus, it's just cool to look at. Um, and I want to tie my thread off and carry on stitching. So, oops. oops. Full screen preview. Okay. I don't really have any particular topics I talk about. It's just whatever occurs to me while I'm working, and most of the time I'm just concentrating on sewing. If anybody shows up in the chat or has any comments or questions, I'm happy to happy to talk. It's just I can't really. Uh, I'm new to streaming, and I'm not a uh, professional radio guy or anything. So I don't know that I don't know how to uh, just talk nonstop for three hours. So at some point I may, if nobody shows up while I'm live, I'll just turn on, turn off the sound, you know, turn off the mic, and I'll listen to someone else's stream. Or maybe I'll listen to it on here where, where y'all can hear it. But, um, what I really would like, is what I got uh, in the last week, I was working on a project and uh, live streaming, and uh, guy showed up in the chat, and we ended up talking for a couple of hours and learned a lot and had a good time. I welcome visitors. Um, that's about that. But I don't know if you were able to see it before, but this is what she looks like so far. So. And so I'm just carrying on getting these uh, locked down. I 
use this dark thread. I started out with a, um, an off-white linen thread, which I really like. It's a, it's a good, strong thread, and I like it. But I like working with it. But it was a little too light. It was, um, and then I was looking at this image here. And, uh, you, can, you can see the uh, the original stuff they used was, was kind of dark. So I changed over to that. And the stuff I'm using now is a really fine thread. And, I have kind of clumsy fingers, so it's not not easy for me to, to work with. There. Right. I'm just tying a knot in here so my thread doesn't pull through my stitch. I've got it pinned to the back too, so I'm trying to do two at once on the same one. And so what I'm doing is I'm putting, uh, line it up because I can feel on the underside, I can feel the edge of the fabric fold, and it's folded over and ironed down, so it, you know, it makes a nice edge. So I just try to roughly match where they are and then hold them kind of together. I don't know if I want to do it quite this way, but maybe through here. Um, I'm going to get them roughly in the same place. I'm going to tuck that, the end of that thread that I just tied, and tuck it under the fabric so it's invisible. Um, then I'm going in on the edge of the top fabric, straight out, and I, I try to go over, like past the underside one. I think I'm past it. And then I come out at an angle over to get my, damn, this isn't going to work out. It's hard to grab through this stuff because I've got three layers of material here. Um, yeah, this is a little better. It, it, it's unwieldy. You can't really feel what I'm doing. And, and I don't want to stretch this weirdly. I'm going to have a, you know, a mess. I just want it to be kind of evenly spread out over my leg here. How's that go? There we go. Like I could feel, I think the underside one sticks a little bit further out, but I can pull it back a tiny bit now. Okay, so there we go. So my needle goes just straight out from where it came out from the last stitch. Now I'm kind of angling it to my left and pulling out and just pull through. And you know, we get a few of these stitches in here so I don't lose my needle and thread, but when I do, I'll, uh, I'll turn this over. I'll show you this side. So these are all roughly perpendicular stitches. And then on the other side, there'll be uh, angled stitches. I'm trying to keep them all relatively small. The originals are, so um, I'm not, not a professional 18th century tailor, but I've had a little bit of experience with it. So I try to, every, with everything I do, I try to get it you know, a little bit closer to the original stuff if I can. That's, for me, that's kind of the fun, is seeing how closely I can copy old stuff sometimes. Um, Feels like it's bunching up here a little bit. I want to relieve some of that slack. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But, so for now, let me just show you the stitch that I just did, or a couple of them. Um, I'm going to switch over to OBS so you can, so I can see in real time when this, uh, what I'm doing with the camera. So see these stitches. So I'm going. So when I'm sewing, I'm going, and I'll show you here. Let me see if I can hold this up. All right, so, so here's where my needle came out. Now, the next one, I go right out, straight out from it, and I go down into the fabric, and then come up at an angle, and I come out down the line, you see? Now, in reality, in the real stitches, I'm actually coming out much closer to the edge and I'm more careful about it. But that's the that's the idea. And then that's the whole stitch. There's nothing more to it. It's not complicated. It's just, uh, you know, just a lot of them to do, that's all. Um, I wonder, I think I should unpin this. 
me think about that for a minute. Because um, it, it seems a little bunched up, and I think it's kind of bunched up because of the way it's pinned here. So if I take that pin out, maybe I can smooth that fabric a little bit better. Um, and I may need to uh, cut the cut the bone somewhere down here and then restitch it just to relieve some of that if I have a bunch of bunching. Um, but we'll cross that bridge if we come to it. Just for now, I'm just going to... I don't know, man. I mean, right now it seems pretty smooth, so I'm going to carry on with it. And I'm almost past the skulls here, just so it'll be easier to hold on to, so maybe that'll alleviate some of this problem, too. Side, it's just going a little bit past that other the bone on the other side. And we want to catch the edge of it, but and I want them pretty evenly spaced. I'm trying to keep 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 even pressure on them and even tension. Nothing fancy though. It's just so I want a power play. I'll show you. Um, in a minute, I can put the, uh, the image back up and I'll zoom in on the stitching on the original. And you can see how finely it was done. Um, let's see here, bring this down. And we'll just zoom in like that. And you can see the, uh, the fineness of those stitches. They're, they're pretty tight, you know, it's pretty nice. I'll go even closer. I mean, in relation to how big that skull is. It's pretty cool. So, so there we are. So here you can see the underside one, they're all kind of angled. So this is the traveler, you know, so the upper side stitch goes straight out from where it came out and then down and then travels over at a, at a slight angle. And, um, and this one on the underside um, catches the other fabric and just moves it down a little bit. Um, unfortunately, with the, and actually in here you can see some angled stitches. None of it's exact, none of it's perfect, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be. It's just that whoever sewed this flag knew how to sew. I mean, I can tell just by looking at it. It's um, you know this isn't just somebody picking up a needle and thread for the very first time, which makes sense if you figure that um, if this was late 18th century, you know everything that anybody ever wore at that time was made by hand because the sewing machine wasn't invented until like 1840. So up until that point, lots of people knew how to sew. You couldn't just, you know, have a sewing machine do it all for you. Anybody who, uh, you know, lots of people could fix their clothes and, or, and there were a lot of professional tailors and you know, that's a big, big, big business all over the place, all over the world. So, okay, I think I am gonna pull that pin out. I don't like it. It's, uh, it's causing me, it's causing this to bunch up and I don't want that. So there we go. And I'm just going to smooth it as I go and if I need to correct it, I'll do that. It's a pirate flag after all. It doesn't, uh, you know, I mean, kind of the point is that it's not following lots of rules, right? Yeah. Something about that is really free and thinking about it that way. I've been, you know, sometimes I get kind of um, bound up in trying to you know, exactly copy something, but I mean, for goodness sake, if you can't be free and easy on a pirate flag, what can you be on it? You know, loose on. So, oh, damn it. All right, so. See, now that I'm past the skull, it's easier to reach my hand around this fabric and grab it. It's a little bit easier to work with. Ah, 
you know what? I felt like I think I was doing okay before. I felt like these last two, I think I put them too far. I want to go back up and do less of that. I want it closer to the edge because it does the job, but it looks cooler. You know, those little tight stitches are pretty nice. And mine aren't that tight. I mean, the ones on the original though look pretty fine. spot check it just to see that they look okay. And I think they do. I'm gonna put this aside and I'm gonna uh, you know what? That should be a little a little further up this way. I mean, it's good but it's needs to I've got this loose fabric here and I'm hoping that I mean it seems when it, when I flatten the flag out it seems that it lays flat and it's okay. It's a little bit loose. But we'll see what happens. And some of that may tighten up when I, when I uh, you know, as, as the rest of it gets built. So I'm going to hang this up over here on the door so I can take a look at it. And uh, where is my painter's tape? Tape. It's low tack, so it doesn't stick and won't pull my paint away. I painted the wall, so I'm, I'm the guy with the interest in keeping that wall nice. And I, I know better than anybody how much work went into cleaning it up. This room was pretty, pretty rough when we uh, when I went to work on it. But let's see here, and there's the flag. It's kind of cool, I think. Okay, so I'll leave it like that and drop down a little smaller. I'm going to put up a historic image just for fun. I don't know what we got. Let's dig through the archive. Um, I kind of like this one. Let's see. This is a really pretty painting. It's a Dutch picture, and this isn't... Uh, I mean, I modified it to put the pirate flag in. It was just a Dutch flag. I put the Dutch flag in there just just because it was cool, but it's a really, I think it's a great picture. And there we go. 
Yeah, well, I don't think I have any uh, viewers. I don't have a whole lot more to say about the stitching. So I'm going to uh, mute the sound. If you happen to be watching live, they are. And I'm listening currently to the Post Kang show on John Malin's channel on YouTube. Um, it's a good show. It's interesting. And I think better when I've got stuff going on in the background. She's not quite in the frame, but the point is to show the flag anyway. So let me just work on the camera here. Let me turn off that message. And uh, put my beautiful picture up. It's not my beautiful picture, but I want to be able to paint that picture or something like it. Not that picture, but I can paint that. And, uh, uh, I'm thinking maybe I ought to because it's pretty rad, you know. So let's put this up. Yes. Get our work back into my lap and let's get to it. Okay. Here we go. So I'm just going to carry on. I'm going to get this last. Uh, I'm going to call it a femur. I don't know if it is, but I'll call it that. Why not? That's a good, as good a guess as any, I suppose. Can you see this? I'll make the camera a little bit bigger. We can get some space here. No, oh. I'm kidding. If no, in this case, if, if if I'm held accountable for here. what's in the chat, and that's not even my chat, but if I'm held accountable to that, then my enemies can go into my chat, type something, not and me. say, "Look, what's in his chat?" He, he, he can't do that. Like that's How about like, that? that? Whoever that's a little that better. is wrote that. Yeah. That's that's a, that's 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 oh, look at that. To, um, that's perfectly framed. Oh, wait. Um, Carry on. So place. anyway, like, hey, look what's going so here. You want, you want while I was. Getting coffee. Why don't we just focus on the Sauska sisters? Some thoughts cold. about this. Yeah, that's hot. I've got three of these I'm doing I mean, right now. Uh, one of them is, is two of them are spoken for, and one I'll do it for the chat. I'm going to put up for sale. And I'm trying to figure out yeah, where to sell it. And I've had an eBay account for a long I time, but I think eBay, at least initially, eBay required the use of PayPal. And I had a PayPal account, uh, and I got it when I got my, I think when I got my eBay account, uh, 2002, so sort of early adopters, <laughs> I think two years ago or so, they introduced a policy whereby they would fine users of PayPal $2,500, and by that, I mean, they would just deduct that from your account if they read something on your social media that they didn't like. And so I canceled my PayPal account. And I hated doing it because I always thought it was a great service. I really liked it. I am. I am. I'm making a slideshow right now. So I had to scan in all of mine and Peaches' childhood photos. And it was convenient over the years. No, it's just going to be projected up on the I got a lot of good use out of it, but... I can't support the reception hall, so that any love something to look at if the system board, that, but, um, that bridges free speech. Yeah, no, no music and because that's the what DJ they were will doing. be playing music the entire night. And it's so I was just thinking, yeah, well, you know, okay, maybe I'll, I'll uh, I can Great America sell. And get this. I could put they the ran other to flag up on my eBay account, and and sell it. Officer, and they took a picture, and I was like, but I've never been more. And I haven't looked into it, so I'm not sure that they require. They require. PayPal still they used to I think um, if they do then I'll have to find an alternative platform and I was thinking you know, I, you know, I initially for just a moment thought well you know okay I'll just get darn I'll have to get a new PayPal account and I won't get my old account back and I liked the fact that I'd had it for 20 years and um, but then I thought you know to, to get it back I would be selling them the rope with which they would hang me someday. You cannot support... I cannot support that kind of a system. Free speech is paramount. As an artist, I have to be able to express myself freely. As a citizen, a free citizen, I have to be able to express myself and to think freely. And 
I cannot in any way support anybody who, uh, who opposes them. So as inconvenient as it is, I cannot do that. So I have to come up with some alternative way of doing it. Like it's, yeah, it's convenient, but there's a heavy price to be paid for that. I don't like that, but that's the way it is. So it's expensive, you know, less convenient, but like they say, freedom isn't free. So maybe that's my cost of freedom of speech is in the future is to not support the abridgment of it in the present. Well, let's see what this is looking like over here. Nah, see, okay, so I'm having to make adjustments as I go and that um, gives it a certain charm, a nice character to it. I'm trying to keep these, uh, keep the bone flat against here and try to work out the, the, the bumps and valleys. And I'm just, uh, just carrying on stitching it. So some of these stitches are nice and tight up against the edge and some aren't, but this is just the way this goes. And I'm just sewing it free. This is a pirate flag and the pirates were nothing if not free. So I'm going to be free and easy with it. And I'm going to have some fun with it. That's the whole point of this project is I've always wanted to sew a pirate flag. It's sort of an expression of freedom. Plus the adventure, and I think back to you ever read Treasure Island or uh, you know, look at uh, Wyatt's painting, the illustrations for Treasure Island, man, that's so cool. Read the general history of the pirates and you think about how tough life in Europe and the Americas even at that time must have been, you know, 1720s, late 1600s even. But then, you know, to, to go from a crowded European city and then get out on the open sea out in, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, the coast of Africa, or sailing up to India, it's pretty awesome. You know? So, i got to make this part of flag, express that, right? That's, that's artistry. I think it was, uh, I read a quote years and years ago from, uh, oh, I've seen it, um, what's his name? Something about, like the gist of it was, he who works with his head, his hands, and his heart is an artist. So I'm definitely putting heart on it. The whole point of this is heart. And the head and the hands here are, Figuring out how to do it and then executing it with these practiced hands. I hope my sound is on. Is it? Yeah, okay. Full screen TV. That's such a cool picture. I love the uh, the way these sails are painted. And what's really interesting, it's something I was thinking about when I was looking at this picture. There's uh, So when you're painting a landscape like this, you have to, you know, obviously just... No, I, I doubt this guy did this on a rocking boat out in the uh, out in the bay or wherever he was, the harbor. Um, rough water, so I'm guessing it's a bay rather than a harbor. But um, so he had, the artist had to get the uh, he's got the angle of the sun right, you know, and all the sun's coming from the upper left and throwing down onto the sails and onto the clouds and onto the, the trees in the, in the background and onto the waves in the foreground. Not only that, but he also has to get the wind consistent too because anybody who knows you know, how, this is, how this works is going to spot you know, all the winds coming from the same direction too. And then I noticed, so I'm looking at these, uh, these sailing vessels and they're not all going the same direction. They're not even all at the same angle in, in those directions. One thing that, that strikes me interesting is, uh, is interesting is, oh, damn it, uh, you know what, how do I want to do this? So what I'm coming up against is I've got this, it's starting to bunch up a little bit here, and I want to work that out so this thing appears to be flat, and it will, but um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold some of this over 
and take up some of that slack. And then I'll stitch it down. And I might even use a, uh, maybe a lighter thread to make that correction. And that'll solve that, I think. And the question is, does it, see the back, the back seems very smooth, but I do have, for whatever reason, it could be just the way I'm sewing this, maybe, you know, draped over my knee here. It's, um, it's kind of bending it, and maybe it's stretching it out a bit. Um, but I want to, I want to take out some of that uh, looseness. So I think what I'll do is I will remove some of that looseness, fold it over, and then correct it that way, because the the underside one seems okay. Um, Oh, so anyway, so my observation about the, the painting here. Um, this is, I don't know exactly when this is. This looks early 18th century to me. Um, it's Dutch. I, I don't know what the painting is. Um, I might have, sometimes when I'm saving these, I'll put the, uh, the date, if I know it, in the, in the tile on the, as I save the image. But uh, I hope I've done that on this. I'm going to pull this pen and uh, let me figure this out here before I go on. Okay, so the underside doesn't look like, look like it has that kind of slack in it. This one has a little bit of slack, and I want to get rid of it. Okay, so I think what I want to do is put... Some kind of horror movie they're watching or something? Okay, so you know what I'm going to try. I'm going to hit this with uh, with a steam iron, and maybe that'll shrink some of the shrink this up a little bit, and I won't have to do that because when I laid it out, it was fine. So it might just be that that part of it has stretched more than it should have. So I'm going to I'm going to steam it a bit and see if that see if that shrinks it a little bit. Um, what's my battery look like on? 46%, that's good. All right, I'm going to switch my cord, charge this up, charge my monitor. Another great boat name, Monitor and Mary Mac. There we go. All right, so I'm going to change the camera a bit. And uh, let me steam this. So here, here's what I'm working with. I've got, it's not a whole lot, but got this little bit of slack here it's you know not a ton and what I could do is just fold it over and stitch it down that'd be an easy fix for it and I may end up doing that but I'm gonna right now just steam it and see if maybe I can get it to shrink and then I'll have to do that I don't know that's part of the fun of doing a project like this is uh, trying out new things and seeing if you can get them to work I don't think 
something like that, and then this needs to go under. some of that uh, steam evaporate but I think that might have might have helped um, meanwhile I'm going to uh, refill my coffee I will be right back put my, my new addition to OBS on look at that be right back So it's, uh, it's kind of nice now. So I'm going to just let that dry for just a minute or two more. And then uh, you get back to the stitching. And that's a good thing to learn. And I might have learned this a long time ago. Maybe that's why it occurred to me now. It seems like a fresh idea, but it's, it's the kind of thing that you figure out over time. And I started hand sewing stuff, I don't know. A decade ago, more than a decade ago, probably 15 years maybe. Um, and I haven't done a ton of it, but I've done uh, more than the average person. But I think that fixed it. So let's see. Let's see if this works. Hope this works. Yeah, I think that's going to do it. So now it lost uh, most of that bunching. There's still a little bit there, but it, it's not so much that I can't work it out just by distributing it uh, with the stitches. Preview. And here we go. So we're on the far side. Right? Yeah. Definitely better. Definitely better. I had a big, there was a big bulge in the fabric and it wasn't laying down nice, but just by steaming it, look at that. You see now it lays nice and tight against there, which is where it was before. So, I learned something new. Uh -huh. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, this is better than I thought it would be. Very nice. So, let's go in here. So I'll just have to do that periodically, I think, because I've got a whole bunch more bones. I'm doing three flags, so I've got, you know, got the rest of this one and another one on this one, and, you know, then two more sets. And each of the each bone is two pieces of fabric, you know, fabric sandwiched over the flag body. So there's going to be this is probably going to show up again. So it's good to figure it out on your first one how how to solve a problem. Oh, nice, 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 nice. And I was able to correct uh, the the um, the alignment of the bones. Like so, the I'm trying to I'm feeling with my left, the middle finger of my left hand. I'm feeling where the edge of this corresponding bone on the other side of the fabric is because I can't see it obviously. So I'm just trying to get in here and get the needle past it and around it, um, so it can come back up and have a nice tight stitch right close to the edge. You see. Some of them I have to go a little further out, but that's just because of the way they're aligned. And uh, you could say that just adds to the, 
it's a handmade charm of it, but in reality, I really like to get them, I like it, I like them nice and tight, you know? Yeah. Just like that, look at that. Oh, damn it, you can't see a thing. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I've got to, I think what I need is some other way to uh, make sure that the camera is showing what I want it to show. I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm learning. My first six streams uh, were on, and I posted them up, and a friend of mine saw, saw, saw one or two of them and said, hey, that's a nice stream. Uh, where's the sound? And then I figured out how to use sound. And, and I figured out a couple of days later how to increase the uh, quality of the video. And you know, I'm just learning as I go bit by bit as things occur like like this problem with the bunching this is that okay that trick with the uh, the iron the steam iron to tighten that up works better than I really thought it was going to I thought maybe it would help it a little bit but this seems to have made it perfect that's exactly what I wanted it to do and I really didn't expect it to work that well so here we go man this is now I'm getting nice tight stitches again, and uh, uh, we're really getting down, uh, we're past the halfway point on this bone, which is good. I'm going to try to finish this tonight. I'm well rested, and well fed, and well hydrated. I took my vitamins. I'm all, all ready to, uh, to make a pirate flag. stitches on the front and on the back. This is, uh, cruising right along now. Got nice, uh, nice and even, nice even spacing. Looks like a pirate flag. I don't know, the original, I mean the original is so cool. Um, and I wonder whether it was, was that sewn on shore and then taken to a boat or, you know, did they, Sew it on sh on board the ship when they went out there. Or, you know, where'd they make that? I don't even, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I doubt you could go to a reputable tailor and get a flag made. Say, uh, you know, I'd like to place an order for. A, I'll, I'll suppose, I suppose maybe a maybe a friendly port. Like, wasn't it? Uh, where was it? South Carolina, North Carolina. Where was the uh, the governor there? He had a short name, I forget his name, but he was friendly with Blackbeard. Like he would take his, uh, you know, they, they were, um, they entertained the pirates because the pirates would bring them cheap goods. And uh, you know, maybe maybe you could find a pirate friendly port where you could have a professional do this up or you know, who knows, maybe it was one of the crew was, was proficient with a needle and, and they made it up. I should go, uh, I can't do this while I'm sewing, but, I mean, you know what, I, yeah, because I really can't, because I have to watch what I'm doing, but, um, books like the General History of the Pirates and, and similar ones give accounts every once in a while of the, you know, a gang of guys going out and deciding to go on the account, as they called it, and um, seek their fortunes. And they would make up, a, and it describes making up a pirate flag, but they don't really give a lot of detail on that. You know, it's just, you know, they made their colors and went to work. Ow. So I've got this needle poking me. Let's get rid of that. I should probably not too worry too much about putting some blood on this. It should probably be christened that way. But let's get this. I don't like the pain. There we go. Yeah, correcting that also makes this go a little bit faster because I'm not having to adjust for the bumps and valleys all the time too. That's a great little trick. So there we go. So now we just roll right along. I'm 
looking forward to uh, weathering these. Once I get, <clears throat> once I get these done, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna weather them up a bit. And I might shoot my musket through them, and you know, put a put a musket ball through it just to give it some, you know, a couple powder burns. And um, I just wanna just wanna make them look cool. I'm gonna give it a little bit of wear and weather. Might scuff it up. And, uh, might even over dye it with a uh, with a, a burnt sienna wash or something just to give it the uh, the appearance of having seen some uh, seen some wear and weather some action. I don't want to obliterate it or destroy it or anything like that, but I do want to I want to give it a history. I like uh, you know as I. As I work on this kind of stuff, I often, you know, I'm telling myself a story about it and I'm making up the story of it, like where did this come from? And in this case, you know, the original has a story, but I don't know it. So, you know, a lot of times I'll try to try to imagine what, you know, what was going on with this when it was made, and then how was it used? How did it come to be somewhere where I can see it? And then I'll make up my own stories about it. So I'm, I'm thinking of you know a lot of the pirate stories I've read over the years, and um, seen the movies and stuff, and, and trying to trying to place this in there. Like where where is this flag? Where have I seen this flag before? You know, or one like it? Okay, I think I'm going to have to. You know what? I can adjust this. This part is actually. That solved that whole problem. Now I'm just going to repin this end. I'm going to, I'm going to work it down this way and just smooth. Um, but then there will be a bit of bunching here, and rather than, well, maybe in addition to ironing it, I'm just going to, uh, um, I'll repin it and get it to uh, flatten out along here. But we're 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 nearly done. We're at the uh, at the end of the bone here. We're getting to it. One of the neat things about the uh, the stitching on this, and it's really small and subtle, so from you know 30 feet, you're not going to notice it probably, but um, but a little closer, um, it kind of provides a sort of crosshatch shading to uh, to the edges of of the, the white fabric because it's a you know it's black thread, it's high contrast, so but it's, I mean it's so fine. Like if I was using a heavier uh, thread, you might actually be able to use that artistically to to shade the edges of it. I don't think they were doing that intentionally oh, yeah. again. Yeah, I think they were, give, give me a skull and crossbones and let's, let's go up pirating. But just as an artistic thing, you could, I think, use your stitches as a cross hatching. point where I want to relieve the, the bunching on here. Um, so I may, let's see what this side looks like. Yeah, see it's happening on this side too. So I've got a little bit of bunching here. It's pretty smooth through here. And I've got a little bit of bunching down at the end. And same thing here. It's pretty smooth through here. I've got a little bunching here. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to pull these pins and smooth it and let this, the end of this bone move up, you know, a quarter or half an inch, whatever, whatever it is. It's not going to be a lot, but it'll be enough just to get this to lay flat on the uh, on the background of the flag and make a horrifying pirate flag. Bring up the chat in case somebody drops in. If you're out there, it uh, looks like nobody's watching, but 
if you're out there and you're watching, drop in, say hi. I'll be happy to chat about history and I'm more inspired because I don't, uh, I'm not a professional radio guy, so I don't know how to just talk nonstop for three hours. But I do know a thing or two about a thing or two, so I'll take all, uh, all requests. All right, let me get my thing pinned up. Let me pin this way. Get back to work. Yeah. Look, I don't know about you. I would have saw. I was a Reference image. And maybe this minimize that. And this one back up. Alright, what I'm after is. Almost is going to 
Yeah. The end of the bones. Yeah, see, those are, those are nicer and rounder, so I want to get them. I want to get them more like that. Right now, we're looking a little rough. I gotta fix that. Their name is Soska, not Soska, and then it's Yaira. What am I saying here? Something else. Yaira. That's what I've been saying, Yaira. She said something else about And the Soska sisters. Soska. Gonna let that sit and cool for a minute, and then we're then we're just gonna carry on and stitch it up. But we're down to the the bottom end. I'll use the mouse here, um, just doing this part. But I mean, it's this one. But, you know, just just doing this part. And, oh, you know what? And looking at this, I was just looking at mine. I'm like, oh man, I've got these these angles more than curves. But looking at this, the original is too. So there's a fold, there's a fold, straight line, an angle. And then it curves, straight line, straight line. So, so it's cool. And you know, of course, at a distance, which is how these are to be seen, uh, it just rounds out. You know, you've got a, you have enough uh, tangents, you make up a circle. So that's what we got. So we're we're cooking. That's the difference between theory and practice. You know, in theory, I want a nice curve, nice smooth round thing. That's not what the original looked like. And I'm really going, I'm trying to get more of the spirit of the original. I'm not making a museum quality stitch for stitch reproduction of this. I'm uh, just making a fun one. But I, I do want it to be really close to it, you know. Like, there's something about this. Uh, my hand? I can't see where I, I, mean, I can see that. So there's something I'm pointing at my monitor because obviously anybody watching this can see my monitor in my hand, right? No, you can see the mouse. Um, this has a charm to it and, and a, a certain terror that it inspired in, the, in the, the ships it was chasing. That's what I'm after. And the best way to get that is to just do what they did. This is the real deal and this is uh, uh, the best way to, to accomplish that. You know. No, you're not. 
not allowed to date my best friend. And she's like, you're just going to, you know, you're going to ruin everything. You're going to make everything awkward. And so she, she gate kept my number from him. It, wait, is she your best friend still? Yeah, she's in my wedding. Oh, okay. Wow. Wait, is it sad? Okay. No, it's uh, hope. So we got this fixed up. Now we're going to stitch it down. <laughs> two stitches. I don't like the way this is lined up. I need to go back to the drawing board on this part. I thought I had them matched up, but I think this is not going to work this way. So I'm trying to rush through it, I think, and it's causing problems. So we're going to go back and undo some of that. Get this needle over here. Trim this. Back to the drawing board.
Try something different here. Unpin it. And we're gonna see if that works any better. I think it will. Oops, so I need a new thread. Needle. It was funny when I was at San Diego Comic Con. Chris had a booth, and so I went to. thing uh, I need to come yes. up with the story. Yes, I didn't want to back like, Kickstarter. Where did this come from? How was it? friend named John won't even come to my wedding. But I got caught up in the point of with him. I do that a lot with, the, with him, my paintings. So, and, yeah. But the paintings themselves don't really tell the yeah. stories very well. And it's you know, something I want to improve yeah. is this actual storytelling. I've always been coming up There's with, with these stories, stories really but I haven't. Buy, but I can't. Somehow it hasn't occurred to me until the last yeah, couple of years me. to start yeah, that's putting. Yeah. Well, that, that's not true. Yeah, I think that. Right I, I used yeah, to. Yeah, but I wanted that fucking book, John. I used to paint hey, I the stories that I was thinking about while I was painting them. Yeah, so, and then somehow I got focused on technical stuff and effects and things like that. And I got away from telling those stories in the pictures. And I just kept them in my mind, which doesn't do the viewer any good because viewer can't see it if it's not in the picture. So uh, I think with really great that I'm I mean, going to start on this putting the stories back friend. in the pictures, That's as I'm going to do with this, because uh, where's my needle? But no, it's, uh, yeah, John, That's you've never seen this, this, uh, where the story was at. Uh, and I'm at, going to do that storm. in this. I'm going to yeah, tell the story like, uh, that's in my head. Just in the, the wear and the holes and the burns and stuff on this flag. There we go. Nice. So, the problem I was running into with this was they weren't matching up on both sides. Now they are. So. You know what I just realized? Sorry to cut you off, Sean. But everybody's cutting everybody off. No, no, no. Because we're looking at his art, and I'm just like, I know what he posts on Instagram and stuff. It's really a. Right up the Saska sisters' alley. So I'm like, could you imagine if he drew Yaira and the Saska sisters wrote it? He should be drawn it. Um, that would be welcome back, to Jane. Him. No, I'm alright. I switched terminals. I'm not looking at that shit anymore. Uh, yeah. Holy You fuck. finished, is what you're saying. You finished. Oh, God. <laughs> Showered up. Yeah. Oh, right, there we go. Wipe, wiped off. Tighten it up. Uh, yeah, thing. now we got it's a good looking. Almost, like it's almost porn and right when you're like okay it's getting good it then it cuts to like blood and guts it's like uh, yeah that's what that's it did the in the trailer that's what i said about the trailer they're they're just about to make out and then you're like yeah and then it's like oh and here's some kind of organ splurt you know it's, it's it's all over all the yeah. so where i was there's a third girl that comes in strips down you can see full nudity she's grinding against the two sisters thighs they're getting undressed i mean it, it turns into disgusting like, what's the name of this movie <laughs> <laughs> for research purposes uh, i i mean i i mean this blows my mind this whole thing blow, I, I mean take eric's books out of it somebody said these these girls wrote for marvel that blows my mind like i, I don't what did they write for marvel black, black widow, widow. Yeah, I mean, oh, you, know, you think, was there any scissoring? Yes. At Black Widow? No. Wait. Yes or no, Anna? What did 
It's implied. In the Black oh. Widow comic that the. Or oh, were they going like this to each other? <laughs> like sound like like. <laughs> Oh, no, because it's so it's Black Widow's dead, but it's her clone, and she goes back to like kill, like get revenge on people, but like stuff in her past. Am I the only one that knows this shit? Yes, oh, I, 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 I mean, I've never heard of their book. I, I knew they did something to Marvel, but I'm go look it up, Shane. I, you know, I kind of look at women with kind of like a higher regard, and like when I find out they read files, I'm like, it doesn't matter after that. She read everything. Like there's nothing to surprise her. Anna, both John and I are experts on the Suska sisters. I'll have you know. Um, now you are. <laughs> Alright, wait, which one is which? I want to find out myself, actually. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. uh, which one is which? Um, well, there's Ingrid and what? Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> Ingrid and Jessica? Yeah, Ingrid and Jessica. So I don't think those are their names, John. They are now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know what's freaking me out? Is I think I've been on stream with them. I went on Eric's oh. stream and they were there. And I was like, oh, where do I Were, you, were you trying to fix them, Shane? I, I, now I would. I, I mean, I didn't know about it then, but now Were you going to uh, sit there and tell them for the next hour and a half how you don't have to do this? You don't have to do this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have. That's what he tried saying to Riley Reed. I did. Oh, you know, shit. Like, You'll find somebody like me that'll love you. I told Riley Reed, I said, maybe you, you could do voice acting in cartoons or something. You have a talented voice, you know, from stretching it out with dicks. And uh, she goes, <laughs> and then years later on Twitter, she's like, she had a cartoon drawing of her. And she's like, wouldn't it be cool if Adult Swim did a cartoon to me? I put that hope in her, John. I'm yeah. the one... Yeah. You were trying to do something else for her, though. Oh, yeah. I tried to yeah. oh, yeah. Shows up and draws, you lied to me, shit. You inseminated her with this idea. Oh. I inseminated Riley Reed with this dream of being more than a prostitute. <laughs> Pretty well, you're like a real Richard Gere, man, I tell you. Uh, <laughs> Crusader Joe, Crus Crusader Joe for two bucks brings up an interesting point. It says, Biggins, isn't Biggins all about the fans and the chat are always right? Yeah, what, what do you do when the fans or the chat or the majority of them are against you? Are they, is the fan and the chat always right still? It's all about, it's all about the chat. That's Biggins' thing. It's all about the chat. Hail to the motherfucking chat. Uh, Jane's Disorder for Five Regorgitated Sacrifice 2008 is a lesbian satanic twin thing where twins oh, kiss each other and make out in their blood. This movie is satanic. I no, know it is. is. It is. Peaches is a twin. Does he make out with his brother? No, that's fucking weird. John has twins. There's a lot of twins in the world. Yeah. Mm. Jeez, you got a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> I had to pause for a minute and go, yeah. And uh, one of them uh, really appreciated your kind words, by the way. And it's doing really well. So, I know that. I'm glad I didn't make a joke. Uh, Danny Hobbit. <laughs> Hobage. <laughs> the Mian. Okay. Part two. Look at this picture. And again, my camera is not set, so you're just watching my. my so, everything but the sewing, right? Oh my gosh, John, are you heartbroken that your Lions aren't going to go to the Taylor Swift concert? Taylor Swift oh, that's concert? Good. What do you mean? Super Bowl. Yeah, oh, Taylor is she playing? She's playing the Super Bowl? No, they spent half the game on her. Like, you know. No, no, no. Listen. Just... Listen, there is 100% we are going to see a collab with Usher and Taylor Swift. She, Her boyfriend's team is in the Super Bowl. She is fucking playing at the halftime show. And she's going to be running for vice president of a She's gonna be on a ticket. No, oh, Yellow Flash is gonna be happy. He's yeah, a little well, obsessed with that girl. Just with Taylor? Joke. Taylor Swift. Yeah, he's got a thing for Taylor Swift, man. Oof. Uh -huh. All right. He wants her to be cast in uh, every comic book movie because that Dazzler. makes her really that makes her really great art. He wants her to be Dazzler in Deadpool and presumably X Men because oh, she'll bring in the fans and they'll she bring will. In the and it, she Listen, will, John, for the but first that, that, is still, life, that is still the short-sighted, retarded thinking of people that are not artists. John, for the first time in a lot of women's lives, women know when the Super Bowl is. 
No, they always knew in the Super Bowl. Oh, the women uh, now know what a football know. schedule is. They, oh, they, they know who's playing, playing this time. Oh, he's banging mm-hmm. a football player? Yeah. So now women are now attracted to football players again? Is that what happened? I don't think it, women ever stop being attracted to football players. I think now women are willing to watch the football games with the boys. Because you know they think they'll see Taylor Swift? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wave. Panatra. I, 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 I got to step in a minute. Panatra. <laughs> um, Bear Wolf said there's a tweet from Jerry to pull up. Do, do, do. So far, so Why good. Uh, Danny for, you. Carrying on. Danny for Working our way around. Less the end, guys. I'm already on my second joint. Hail, Danny. Appreciate you, man. Uh, Darren Wagner's out here for two bucks. Uh, wow. Shikama Chat. Finn uh, for the win. Bow, hail. Bow. Call me D-Way. What is Shikama Chat? What does that mean? Your mom. Uh, it's like... It's like Namaste or something like that. She you know, John, I bet if I would have invited your mom, she would have come to my wedding. Yeah, she probably would have. Aw. Oh, I'm here, so. <laughs> 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 exchange ever. <laughs> uh, Travis Parrick. Yeah, Finn, Finn can go. Finn, you have my spot, and then you can, I will send you money, and you can hand deliver it to Anna on the day of her wedding. Oh. Is it? I don't know. Yeah, I'm probably be a freaking mess if I go there. I'm going to kick it to like all the chicks because they're going to be probably all gorgeous and I'm going to be able to help myself. And I'm being all of my warm. cousins? Yeah. All of them. Every single one. All of her hairy cousins. Her hairy <laughs> <cousins>. <laughs> I'm bring the raises. At Bear Wolf, just, at Bear Wolf, just send me the tweet. Uh, Travis Ferry for two. Two Yaros and one cup. Oh, God. Mm. Is that what's going to happen in that book? I hope not. I don't want to see that. I, I think it's I think it's gonna be fucking vanilla. That's what I think that. I, I think it's gonna be, and everyone's gonna be disappointed. It's gonna be like Hulk Hogan with vanilla. Like everyone's gonna be disappointed. Yeah. Uh, Bebop, nineteen eighty-eight for two. Is that Bowser choking out a raccoon, Anna? No. No, that's her uh, Bowser hat, though. That's me. Put put me big screen. Um, look at look at how cute. I got really drunk on my birthday, and I got a Bowser hat in the mail, and I put it on, and I started singing the Peaches song. And oh, yeah, I was there. Some, a, a, a Tindo in the chat uh, decided to do some fan art of me, and I liked it so much that I bought it from him, and I made a sticker, which will go out with everyone's calendar. Anna, <laughs> your, your peace sign is very close to your mouth. Are you, are you trying to say something? No, I was trying. Oh, like a vagina. Oh, he's crossing his sisters. No, no, no. I think he didn't want to block my eye, but Sailor Moon does that where she puts it like in front of her eye. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know? What is that? Like a uh, metaphor for evil eye? Is that what that is? Like uh, some uh, secret society shit? Is that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so Lord Raptor Jesus for two. Blood Tater. That's yo ass. Blood Tater, that you ass, John. Uh, okay, Bob Cable, <laughs> I-99. Anna, which YouTuber has disappointed you most? Congrats, Har, F-R? Yeah. Um, F-R? That's a hard one. I've been disappointed a lot. <laughs> She's been around forever or something. Uh, you and Yancey got a lot in common. Aww. <laughs> 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 I don't like it that. It depends on, like, what kind of, like, YouTuber, like, documentary YouTuber, art YouTuber, like, what? Who made you cry the last? Kelsey's not a YouTuber. Hmm. He's a fan of videos. I'll, I'll think about it. We'll come back to this one. Uh, for the record, let it be known that Kelsey was the last one to make Anna cry. Uh, That's a song. On YouTube? I guess so. Wait, no, you, you, wait, you've cried since crying about what? Kelsey? What are you crying about? No, no, not about Kelsey. No, I'm making this slideshow of, like, me and Peaches, right, and he was the cutest fucking baby, and it, it was like, oh, my God, he's so cute. It made me pregnant. cry. Yeah, I mean, women, are, they can't control their emotions. No, I'm not that. pregnant, but I'm just no, like... No, those I, eggs are dropping, though. Listen, if I do get pregnant, I'm going to have a baby that looks like that, and that is awesome. Cause he what was if a, it looks like you? Oh, I used to try to pick up chicks by showing a baby. I no seriously, I used to try to pick up chicks by showing them my baby picture. I'm like, you want one of these? <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you got Yanzi? Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. The 
shows like 80% goofing around, 20% are in sales or That's the mix that they're after. It seems to work really well. Turns out he didn't want to watch so Star Trek. Trek. He, there is not a man alive. I don't care what these guys say. That has not sat and watched fucking Star Trek. They're all fucking lying. They've all seen at least one episode of Star Trek. And if you press them hard enough, they'll all fucking admit it. <laughs> and if Me Too story is lame, fuck. <laughs> 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 no, it's not, a, it's not a Me Too. I wanted to get that shit out of the way. But I was so disappointed. I'm like, oh, so glad. Maybe I could do that. Like, I'm so offended by how bad this was. I should have just watched Star Trek. Like, that... Oh. We're, we're Russell Oliver, too. Oh, just went where no man went before. <laughs> just rub exactly. a little peanut butter on your leg, Shane. Mm. What? Oh, for the dog? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wait, you have a dog? No, Anna's dog. I, yeah, it said... Never mind. That was like an hour ago. Oh, okay. Tuna at the wedding. No. Is she going to carry the rings? That's weird. You're uh, going to satisfy yourself to, to Anna's dog? Dude, that would be funny if your dog eats the rings and then you have to follow it around for like three days. <laughs> that is fine. She, I hate Peaches' ring. She can swallow that thing. Wow. What? Ooh. picked it out. It's so ugly. He, he found this thing where it was like a Portuguese treasure chest that had been found in the oceans and it had all these no. coins of like real Portuguese pirate gold. And it, somebody made a ring out of it, and it's this Portuguese coin that's solid gold from like the 14th century. And he's like, "That's what I want." And I'm like, "It's so ugly. You look like you're supposed to be like an extra in The Godfather." And okay. it didn't fit him when he first there came in, and he was wearing it on his pinky. And I'm like, "This is stupid." But he likes it. All so right, so we've got one done. Ta da! Swallowing the red Good start on Pirate Flag. Uh, Barb Rogers for five bucks. Uh, Wolves, That's Tigers, pretty cool. Frogs, so, Indigo next, we so take yeah, this up. And we're going to get on to the next. Me. I or anyone. Oh, I like it. Good job, Gaspel. It will strike terror in the heart of the Sasuke sisters, uh, you know, and, and <laughs> lesbian Choke out. So the chicks that Eric got to write his Yaira book, they are do lesbian porn. Do, do, do. Yeah, let me take this uh, campaign that. down. Here we go. Right, go <laughs> That's gonna be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That ugly as fuck. It was the same thing. No, but they, they, no, no, they kind of are. But when they kiss, you, are, you know, you're not gonna not look at them. Kids. Yeah, choke out incest, man. You <laughs> were decent when you were younger. Hold on, Shane, pull up, pull up the kissing video. So I'm not, I'm out. not, I'm done, I'm not. I All right, want to see so this is my camera, so let's see that. You bring it up. I got let's uh, it. adjust this. Let's put the other image up. Yeah, yeah, what, right. yeah, what am I going to do? I'm going to find the thing that i got to find the two seconds of it. Like, you are going to do that. Stop being a fucking bender. Get it up. Stop being a felon. Yeah, go on. We'll raise this a bit. Here we go. Look at that. That's a pirate. There we go. All right. Let's get back to it. So first I want to find something to listen to. Give me a general history of the pirates and I'll be happy. I'm going to listen to that. If I can get it to load properly. And we're going to put more bones on more flags. First one is good. If I can get the other ones to be that good, I will be very happy. And I know I can. But a general history of the pirates. I wonder if I should record that. Then I could listen to it, you know? And I'm going to read it again anyway. I like that book. It's fun. Okay, I'll let this load. 
Take a plug it in so we get some more electricity stored in the battery. And then we will carry on. So what I have to do now is uh, oh, I can turn that off, right? And let's put the picture back up because it's beautiful. There we are. All right, so what I have to do now is get the uh, um, pairs of bones for the smaller flag, or not the, the smaller pairs of bones for the other flags. I have the, the large ones are all ready to go, but I want to do them all at the same time. So the one on the, I'm going to turn this just a little bit toward the other flag. How about that? Um, what I, I'm making three flags. I've got one oriented vertically with a much larger skull and bones. Because that's what, uh, what my friend wants. And for these other two, uh, they're going to be smaller. And I've got all the, all, the fat, all the bones are cut out and they're ready to go. So I have to now fold them and iron them so I have the, uh, uh, the, the proper size and shape of them. And then I have to match them, you know, the matched pairs that sandwich over the flag body. Um, so I'm going to do them, and I'm going to do all of them at this stage. Because um, they, they all, you know, this uh, slash oriented that way on the front of the flag is, is the first one that goes on, and then the, the other bones go across it. So I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to do that now. And... I think I'm ready to go. Look, all my stuff's there. I'm going to have to add some water to my iron so it's steamy. And then we're cooking. Right? Again, we're just going methodically through this. I was hoping by now to be listening to a general history of the pirates, but alas, it seems not. Curve, it should curve this way, it should curve like that, and 
It does. There's a slight green curve. Um, I guess that's okay, just like that. So the iron's, iron's hot. Look at that. We got steam. We got fabric. We got work cut out for us, literally. And I got a couple pirate flags in the making. So here we go. I think the way I, you know, I actually thought I was going to trim this down. I think I didn't leave quite enough of a seam allowance. It's not really what you call it—a margin, a border, a extra fabric to fold over. Um, I think if I do this again, I'll leave a little bit more. This is about three eighths of an inch, and it, it's okay, I guess, if it's square pieces. But but it being, uh, yeah, this is curved, weird shapes and stuff. I think it would be easier to work with if it was just slightly more. It would give you more flexibility and rank. I'm going to hit this once and then I'm going to uh, indulge in a little coffee and a smoke. Let's hit this down here. Just see what this looks like. So I've, I've laid the, uh, the fabric down and then laid the paper pattern over it. And it's, the pattern is slightly smaller than the fabric. So now I'm just folding the edges over and ironing it down to, uh, to get the, the shape of the bones. And I'm just working my way around the whole thing. I'd like to have a camera um, that'll, you know, like over my shoulder here, or, you know, really I love to show where it is. Hey there. What's up, Scout? How are you doing? You ready to help? Uh, but for now, I just have to describe what I'm doing and then um, i show you the results. You know. I'll do my best to make it understandable what, how to do this. Scissors. I'm going to relieve some pressure because I have a tight curve here. I'm just going to snip this to allow it to curve more tightly in this one spot. And here on the opposite side. Okay, let's see if that helps. Please do not scratch the table. Curve and to allow it to curve, I've got 
snip that to allow it to bend around that curve like that. And I'll have to do that on subsequent pieces too. You know, these are all uh, I'm making sandwiches. So this one will be on the other side, on the back side of the thing, and then uh, there will be a mirror of it on the other side. Hey! speak English yet, but you must quit that. It's adorable, but ornery. So quit that. So now I'm just rolling the, uh, the curves around the, uh, the template here, just shaping these bones with a little bit of folded under so that you don't have an exposed edge that will fray and get worn. Just makes it sharp and crisp and makes it look cool. And a lot of these are kind of straight and as they are in the original. When I showed that earlier, you can see it's really a series of tangents, which is um, sort of how the material works, you know. And there we go. Do them all like this. I'm doing two pairs. Two pairs? Yeah, two pairs of this bone because they have two flags. And then uh, I'll lay them upon each other and then adjust finely to get them to match up. What I want is a, is a close match from on one side to the other so that they uh, so that they overlay. That just makes the stitching look nicer and match better. shape before I go moving around too much. Um, and you can't see a thing, I know, but just take my word for it, it looks cool. Um, in, in, a, in a very short while, I'll have two pairs of that bone, but smaller to fit this other flag, um, the one that's behind my head here, uh, this one. And uh, then I'll match them up and then finally adjust them just so they, so they really line up. Then I'm gonna pin them onto each of these flags and I'll stitch them down. Um, and since they're smaller, they're necessarily going to go quicker. Um, they might have, have a few different problems than this one because they have uh, uh, just tighter curves. And, and, and you know, 
working with this this material so it may take a little bit more finesse to get it to match up but it might not i don't know i've never made a pirate flag before so we'll find out that's, that's part of the fun of doing a, a new thing is uh you know i don't know <laughs> let's see what happens that's 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 the joy in it for me is you know hope this works let's see what happens <coughs> How come I don't have any Team YouTube things on the... Let me see that. I want to see something here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I dig that. That's a cool image, man. That this is the most engaging or fascinating live stream, but I think this is the most exciting live stream that you could possibly hope for. Ready to, uh, you look like you're ready for a nap. Well, I'm ready to sell a pirate flag, so I'm gonna finish this and then I'm gonna get back to it. So you sleep and I'll make a pirate flag. And then you and I can go pirating and you can have all the mice we catch. What do you think of that? I don't know why I can't get this thing to play. I'm trying to uh, play this audio book that I've listened to before and I really enjoy it. It's a great book. I've read it. The I have a physical copy of it that I've read two times at least. And there's a great audio book that I've listened to before but for some reason it won't load. I don't know why. Maybe it's too big or you know, something. I'm trying to listen to it on my old phone which really is sort of limited in its capabilities now. But We'll see. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. Anyhow, I'm going to drink a little coffee here and think this over, and then I'm going to make some bones. Make my bones. So we've got one set. Now I've just got to do the corresponding mirror of it, and now I've got to do the other pair, and I'll, uh, I'll pin them all, all on to the two flags that, that they go to. Um, and it's going to be that design. Uh, I want to do all three of these at the same stage all the way through. Yeah, I prefer that to having, uh, like doing all of this one and getting it done and then having to start all over. I feel like it kind of all wraps up at once and it's sort of a, sort of a prize for finishing. It's just, uh, uh, it's just the way I think about it. So I'm going to, and not only, and there's a practical reason for it too. I mean, that's really how I think about it is like, oh, you know, I want them all done. I don't like to go back to the very beginning and start over. Um, the practical reason for doing that is that you're going to have unique problems at every stage of a multiple a project that involves multiples. And um, once you solve them, it's much easier to, for me at least, once I've solved them, uh, it's much easier for me to just keep that solution in mind as I work on on that same operation so it's it's a kind of mass production I mean, you know it's a mass of three so it's not you know i'm not driving a huge factory here but uh you know with thousands in production but 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 even three is you know a lot to keep track of if you have 
tiny pro lots of tiny problems to solve along the way. So I, I like to do it all sort of at the same stage for each one. So I've done the big, I've done the important one. The other two, one's for me and one is uh, for uh, something else. But um, I'm, I'm really, really pleased with the way it's coming out. It's going to be cool. These are going to be really neat. Um, and what I'm really looking forward to is as soon as I get these finished stitching, either tonight or it, it maybe tonight, it, I'm going to do as much as I can tonight and then um, at the very latest, tomorrow I'll finish them um, it, at this stage. And they'll, they'll all be, all the, fabric, the flags themselves will be complete. And I have two of the, uh, I have one of the ropes completed, uh, was spliced. All of them have the leather stitched on for the eye. Um, one is spliced. The other two need uh, uh, short splices in them, um, which is uh, just a, you know, a very, sh very little bit of, of work. As soon as those are done, then I get to the really fun part, which is painting on the eyes and the nose and the, you know, the definite, just all the shadows and actually painting these um, and then weathering them all. And that's, that's, this is, we're coming up, as soon as the bones are on, then it's, it's all like just pure fun for the whole rest of the project, which is, which is going to be really cool. These are, uh, these are fun. I was thinking earlier, and I had the mic off, and I probably should have left it on, but um, I have an old telescope. And I think it might be cool to see if I can film a short video clip through the lens of the telescope and put the flag off in the distance against the sky. Um, I'm landlocked. I don't, I don't live near the ocean anymore. But I, I think it might be cool to, if we have a, a windy day as soon as I get these done, to uh, haul them up a, a flagpole and film them up against the sky blowing but through this uh, 18th century telescope. I think that would be kind of neat. I want to see if I can do that. In fact, I am going to try that. I don't know if it will work, but I don't, uh, I don't know. There's a distinctive look that the lenses of that telescope have. I mean, it's a hand ground, it's hand ground lenses and it's, you know, it's an authentic old uh, uh, nautical telescope and to uh, to see my modern reproduction pirate flags through that I think that's a cool little shot so I'm going to try for it but in order to get there I have to finish these so to that end I'm going to refill my coffee and I'm going to goof around for a few more minutes just because I feel like it and um, then I'm going to come back and Make my bones. So when I was downstairs, I just uh, had to walk by a box of fabric that I have. I've got some red wool. I want to show this picture. I found when I was doing the research for this project, um, I found this, which is also an authentic pirate flag. These are like the only two that, that are known to exist that I know of from the 18th century. Um, I think this one was captured off the Barbary Coast, uh, which is in North Africa. 
in about 1780. Uh, and I have red wool. And if I could find a better reference image, you know, higher quality, this is really crappy. But if I could find a better image, I'd love to make this one. Uh, and I think I want to, so, as an aside. Anyway, back to, I'm just gonna ramble for a few minutes while I sip my coffee, let my hand rest and muse about pirate flags, kind of goofing off. And still can't get this audiobook to load. I really would like to listen to this. It's a great, great story. Maybe it's just this uh, channel. I don't know. I'll give this one more try and then I'll try a different uh, YouTube channel version of it. And hell, if that fails, I'll read it myself, record it, and upload it to YouTube. Let me shut this for just a moment. I will be right back. Let me put this on. So we'll put that on and that. All right, we're getting loose and I don't give a fuck anymore. So here's what's going to happen. I am going to turn that off. I'm just going to start playing this honestly. Um, I don't give a shit anymore about that. So there's that. This is the best you get. That's the best quality I can manage right now. So I'm going to put the image up. There is a way in OBS to display the chat and I'd like to overlay that. How do I do that? Let's see. There was a way to break that out and to display it. Um, how to show live YouTube chat in OBS. I had it working before then there was an update but I didn't use it for almost a year and then um, then there was an update and that thing went away. So. Go to your YouTube channel, the icon is in top right. Go live. So, oh, pop out chat. Go to your YouTube channel, go live, and then pop out chat. Copy the URL. All right, let's try that first. Let's see if this works. I hope this works because I've been using my phone to, uh, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, I've been using my phone to act as a monitor. I have one one monitor for my PC and uh, using that because I want to be able to see if somebody chats and that has worked once or twice when people have chatted to me here um, but okay so let's go live so let go live and then I want to pop out chat and then copy that URL and then and I don't know I have to go I'm just doing this one thing at a time um, how do I pop out the chat? Three dots. Pop out chat. Okay. Ah, look at that. Okay, so now, check that out. Thank you. Uh, I don't know who posted this. I'll have to see. Okay, so I popped out the chat. And now, how to show live. Open OBS and select the scene for use with the chat box. Let's, let's go. I want to see this. Tom'sHardware.com. Thank you, Tom's Hardware. Okay, so let's see this. Connect to your viewers and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't need all this. I want, I want those instructions again. Please. No, don't need that. No, no, no. What is that? Yeah, this is not... What the fuck is this? Get off of my screen. God damn, dude. All right. Well, you know, I'm less happy now. I'm, I'm trying to do something and you, you just throw all this shit at me. I'm, I'm just not interested in it, man. I, I want to pop my chat out and I want to get back to work. And by back to work, I mean sitting here drinking coffee and smoking a cigarette and thinking about how to make these pirate flags look really cool. Using YouTube. All right, there we go. Open a browser to YouTube. Done. Go to YouTube channel. Done. Go live. Done. Pop out chat. Did it. Copy the URL. Got it copied on the clipboard. Open OBS and select the scene for use with the chat box. Using the browser scene for the chat box. Okay. Under sources, <clears throat> excuse me, add a browser source. All right, here we go. So, sources. Let's see here. Where is sources? Right. And then browser. Ah, look at that. I 
I think we're on track. Wait, what's that? Where's the instructions? Where are my instructions? There. Add a browser source. Done. Rename to YouTube chat box. Let's try that. Okay, I'm just going to follow these and we'll see what happens. Renew. YouTube chat. Okay. Oh, look at that. That's cool. Okay. And then replace the URL with the chat URL and click OK to save. Width and height can be tweaked to provide the best possible layout. Okay. So, all right. So I like Tom's hardware.com instructions here. I do not like all the pop-ups because I'm not interested in that and I'm not inclined even to, I don't even know what the pop-ups were for. It was just annoying stuff in my way. So replace the URL with the thing that I got. Okay, I can adjust the size here. Control audio via, <clears throat> excuse me, via OBS, custom C, oh dude, you can do custom CSS and refresh browser when scene becomes active. I don't know what that means, but I don't need that. I need this. All right, so I can adjust. Oh, do I have to do this in the beginning? Let's see. Let's say, okay. Um, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Look at that. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> now, can I make this transparent? That'd be kind of cool. Oh, maybe with CSS, right? Let's put this here. Go here. Oh, okay. You know what? It's 800 by 600. So it is going to be, yeah, let's do that. We're going to go, let's adjust the widths. Let's say 400. Try that. Oh, look at that. That's better now. So, mm -hmm. any other background color? Ooh, doo -doo -doo. All right. All right. That's cool. Very good. Very good. Very good. Now let's test it. Um. So I'm looking at my, oh yeah, I'm watching my stream on, the phone. So I'm gonna see if this will, and then I'm just gonna look for body, background, color, like how do I, is there, oh, RGBA, right? How about we put, we just changed the, uh, the fourth entry here, right? Background RGBA, A is alpha, and that's the transparency. So let's see here. Point. Let's try 0.5. 0 0.5 probably, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't see anything there. Hmm, maybe not. See, one is fully transparent. Yeah, now it hides everything. If I make it transparent, let's try uh, zero point two five. Now, nah, see, now it makes it. Oh wait, no, it's still there. It's visible. Let's try it again. Let's go zero point five. It's not transparent though. Why can I not get the alpha on it? Hmm. Let's see. Well, you know what? For now, this probably works. I can maybe adjust this and make it beautiful later. So why don't I just leave it alone? And we'll see. But Tom's Hardware.com, how to add chat to OBS. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to stick with that. I thought maybe if I, let me say, uh, let's just leave it like that. I, I think that's sufficient. So let's go here. <clears throat> I wish to see my channel. Let's see what it looks like on the monitor. And then you're going to get weird feedback, but there's nobody here anyway, so I'm just checking. Or maybe there is, I don't know. 
yeah what I want to do is make this chat box at least semi-transparent but still keep the uh, the text visible <clears throat> it's not strictly necessary but it'll help me because then I can use my phone for other things namely listening to uh, pirate stories but I don't think that's possible so we're just gonna leave it like that for now I'll be able to see if anybody comes in and let's let's check in real time does this work um, just added a chat box via OBS and OBS by the way is really really cool software and so whoever developed it thank you hey look at that and, and it's quick it's you know, I guess just within a couple of, you know, what, was that 10 seconds delay? Something like that. So my latency is decent. The chat box works. So now I'm able to see if somebody comes in and says hello or asks a question or tells me some cool stuff about pirates. All right. So there we go. Let's close that. Let's get back up here. Hey, sweetheart. Hello, Scout. How are you doing, honey? How are you doing? Do you full screen preview? Look at this, we got pirates. These aren't, strictly speaking, pirate ships, except I added a black flag to one of them, so now he's a pirate. Hello, darling. How are you doing? Do you want to play ball? Do you want to get your ball? She discovered that the Sharpie marker is an excellent toy today, and she played with it for about an hour. It was hilarious. All right, you got to... Well, you can sit here for a minute because I'm going to uh, sit back here for a moment and check this out and then goof off for a little bit. And then we're going to find a, uh, you know what, I don't need to do this. Oh, wait. That actually doesn't solve my problem. But I... Can I use a background image? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I can maybe go this way. Let's try this. All right, so this can go. I can close this. I'm going to try it on this phone, which is really. Great, and it works. That's exactly what I wanted to see. Look at that. Okay, so now I have a monitor that will show the chat. Now I can work on the composition and make it pretty later, but let's, we've got it roughly sketched in. What's this look like? I need more charge on there. What's my battery on this one doing? 58%, beautiful. All right, cool, man. There we go. Hello. I love a little pet dude. Oh, he's purring. All right, let's see if we can find some good pirate stories to listen to while we make bones. What do you think of that? Don't get too comfortable. You've got to get up here in a minute. Oh, I know, you're very sleepy. You're very sleepy. Beautiful. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's kind of cool. You're a sweet little thing. I'll tell you what, I'll move. Why don't I do this? I'll move the yardstick, and then you can sleep on the tent again. Oh my goodness, you're purring like an engine. See if we can get this history of the pirates to load. I am 
No, we this don't. is a LibriVox recording. And All by the way, LibriVox makes some great debate. audiobooks. For more information, return back to Pergamus and command. Okay, the I don't want the ancient stuff. Even though, if you listen to a general history of the pirates or you read it, get the book. It's awesome. Um, the former they sent away to you. You know, the, some of the early stuff is great. They talk about the, this the Caesar was captured by pirates, and that is a fascinating and hilarious story. But I want right now uh, American and Caribbean coast pirates. With three men and the mate, under the command of a Spanish officer and crew, the side of the was taken. The latter they carried off with them, putting the master and all the crew aboard Captain Jones's ship. They plundered yeah. Captain Jones's of 36 men okay, slaves, you can here for some gold minutes. dust, all and his clothes, to get four up. great and guns, and small to to arms, and about 400 tonight. gallons of rum. Besides his provisions and stores, computed in all to 1,500 pounds sterling. End of introduction, part two. Chapter one, part one of the general history of the pirates, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. This might be the greatest all book LibriVox ever written. recordings are in the public domain. Well, okay, not the greatest. For more greatest. information you know or to volunteer. Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The this General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, early. by Charles Johnson. Early in the 1720s. Chapter 1, Part oh. 1. None some of people these argue that it was written by Daniel Defoe, so but talked of uh, for a while there's some controversy about that. He made his great annoyance and in the world. Even if it's not entirely accurate, it's now. the spirit of it, it was really good. And it's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun. great consequence. He was represented in Europe as one that had raised himself to the dignity of a king and was likely to be the founder of a new monarchy, having, as it was said, taken immense riches and married the great mogul's daughter, who was taken in an Indian ship which fell into his hands, and that he had by her many children, living in great royalty and state, that he had built forts, erected magazines, and was master of a stout squadron of ships, manned with able and desperate fellows of all nations, that he gave commissions out in his own name to the captains of his ships and to the commanders of his forts and was acknowledged by them as their prince. A play was writ upon him called The Successful Pirate. That's a great phrase. And play was written upon him. And attained such belief that several schemes were offered to the council for it's fitting out a squadron to take play was written him, about him. while others were for offering him and his companions three hundred years Greece, ago, the language is and inviting word. them to England with all their treasures least his growing greatness might hinder the trade of Europe to the East Indies. Yet all of these were no more than false rumors, improved by the credulity of some and the humor of others who love to tell strange things. For, while it was said, he was aspiring at a crown, he wanted a shilling, and at the same time it was given out, he was in possession of such prodigious wealth in Madagascar. He was starving in England. No doubt, but the reader will have a curiosity of knowing what became of this man. Certainly. And what were the true grounds of so many false reports concerning him. Okay. Therefore, I shall. Let's get to it. We're going to go make them all right now. All right, sweet. So it was born in the West of England. We have to get up and get a sweet demonstrator. Being bred to the sea, he served as a mate of a merchantman in several training voyages. It happened need. before the Peace of Ryswick, Bones. when good. there was an alliance betwixt Spain, England, Holland, and etc. against France, that the French in Martinico carried on a smuggling trade with the Spaniards on the continent of Peru, which by the laws of Spain is not allowed to friends in time of peace. For none but native Spaniards are permitted to traffic in those parts, or set their feet on shore, unless at any time they are brought as prisoners. Wherefore, they constantly keep certain ships cruising along the coast, whom they call the Guarda del Costa, who have the orders to make prizes of all ships they can light of within five leagues of the land. Now the French growing very bold in trade, and the Spaniards being poorly provided with ships, and those they had being of no force, it often fell out that when they light of the French smugglers, they were not strong enough to attack them. Therefore, it was resolved in Spain to hire two or three stout foreign ships for their service, 
which being known at Bristol, some of the merchants of that city fitted out two ships of 30 odd guns and 120 hands each, well furnished with provisions and ammunition and all other stores, and the hire being agreed for by some agents of Spain, they were commanded to sail for Corona or the Groin, there to receive their orders and to take on board some Spanish gentlemen who were to go passengers to New Spain. One of these ships, which I take to be called the Duke, Captain Gibson, commander, Avery was first mate, and being a fellow of more cunning than courage, he insinuated himself into the goodwill of several of the boldest fellows on board the other ship, as well as that which he was on board of. Having sounded their inclinations before he opened himself, and finding them right for his design, he at length proposed to them to run away with the ship, telling them what great wealth was to be had upon the coasts of India. It was no sooner said than agreed to, and they resolved to execute their plot at ten o'clock the following night. It must be observed, the captain was one of those who are mightily addicted to punch, so that he passed most of his time on shore in some little drinking ordinary. But this day he did not go on shore as usual. However, this did not spoil the design, for he took his usual dose on board, and so got to bed before the hour appointed for the business. The men also who were not privy to the design turned into their hammocks, leaving not upon deck but the conspirators, who indeed were the greatest part of the ship's crew. At the time agreed on, the Duchess's longboat appeared, which Avery hailing in the usual manner was answered by the men in her. Is your drunken boatswain on board? Which was the watchword agreed between them, and Avery replying in the affirmative, the boat came aboard with sixteen stout fellows and joined the company. When our gentry saw that all was clear, they secured the hatches, so went to work. They did not slip the anchor, but weighed it leisurely, and so put to sea without any disorder or confusion. Oh, gee. Though there were several so ships that lined the bay, knows what's among them a Dutch frigate of forty guns, the captain of which was offered a great reward to go out after her. But my hair who perhaps would not have been willing to have been served so himself, could not be prevailed upon to give such usage to another, and so let Mr. Avery pursue his voyage, whither he had a mind to. The captain, who by this time was awakened, either by the motion of the ship or the noise of working the tackles, rung the bell. Avery and two others went into the cabin. The captain, half asleep and in a kind of fright, asked, what was the matter? Avery answered coolly, nothing. The captain replied, something's the matter with the ship. Does she drive? What weather is it? Thinking nothing less than it had been a storm and that the ship was driven from her anchors. No, no, answered Avery. We're at sea with a fair wind and good weather. At sea, says the captain. How can that be? Come, says Avery. Don't be in a fright. But put on your clothes and I'll let you into a secret. You must know that I am captain of this ship now, and this is my cabin. Therefore, you must walk out. I am bound to Madagascar with the design of making my own fortune, and that of all the brave fellows who joined with me. The captain, having little recovered his senses, began to apprehend the meaning. However, his fright was as great as before, which Avery perceiving, bade him fear nothing, for, says he, if you have a mind to make one of us, so the problem you. I've run into and if you'll turn is that in my, my fabric is trimmed too tight. I, may make you I don't mind tenants. trimming a bit off not, of this here's kind of a paper template, and you shall be sent to uh, allow the captain was more glad to hear this, this. Therefore, so accepted this offer. Shame off the whole crew being called up to know who is willing to go on shore with the captain and who to seek their fortunes with the rest. There were not above five or six men who were willing to put this in the sewing scissors. Wherefore, do not use sewing scissors on paper. paper. That destroys the edge. So I'm going to go shore find well. some scissors. Well, I'll return in a moment. They proceeded on their voyage to Madagascar, but I do not find they took any ships in their way. When they arrived at the northeast part of that island, they found two sloops at anchor, who, upon seeing them, slipped their cables and ran themselves ashore, the men all landing and running into the woods. These were two sloops which the men had run away with from the West Indies, and seeing Avery, 
they suppose him to be some frigate sent to take them, and therefore, not being a force to engage him, they did what they could to save themselves. He guessed where they were and sent some of his men on shore to let them know they were friends and to offer they might join together for their common safety. The sloop's men were well armed and had posted themselves in a wood with sentinels just on the outside to observe whether the ship landed her men to pursue them. And they, observing only two or three men to come towards them without arms, did not oppose them. But having challenged them, and they answering they were friends, they led them to their body, where they delivered their message. At first they apprehended it was a stratagem to decoy them on board. But when the ambassadors offered that the captain himself, and as many of the crew as they should name, would meet them on shore without arms, they believed them to be in earnest. And they soon entered into a confidence with one another. Those on board going on shore, and some of those on shore going on board. The sloop's men were rejoiced at the new ally, for their vessels were so small that they could not attack a ship of any force, so that hitherto they had not taken any considerable prize. But now they hoped to fly at high game, and Avery was as well pleased at this reinforcement to strengthen them for any brave enterprise. And though the booty must be lessened to each, being divided into so many shares, and yet he found out an expedient not to suffer by it himself, as shall be shown in its place. Having consulted what was to be done, they resolved to sail out together upon a cruise, the galley and two sloops. They therefore fell to work to get the sloops off, which they soon effected and steered towards the Arabian coast. Near the river Indus, the man at the masthead spied a sail, upon which they gave chase. And as there they came nearer so to her, they perceived her to be a tall ship, around, and fancied she might be a Dutch East Indian, a more better, to, uh, get but she proved chance. to be a better so prize. See, when they fired at her to bring to, she hoisted Mogul's colors, and seemed to stand upon her defense. Avery only cannonaded at a distance, and some of his men began to suspect that he was not the hero they took him for. However, the sloops yep. made use of their time, just and coming a bit off, on the bow and the other on the quarter of the now, ship, now clapped her on board properly. and entered her, upon which she immediately struck her colors and yielded. She was one of the great mogul's own ships. But I want to hear there from this, this uh, instances of the, the black flag. Support, among whom, it was said, was one of his daughters, who were going on a pilgrimage to Mecca, that Mohammedans, thinking themselves obliged once in their lives to visit that place, and they were carrying with them rich offerings to present at the shrine of Muhammad. It is known that the Eastern people travel with the utmost magnificence, so they had with them all their slaves and attendants, their rich habits and jewels, with vessels of gold and silver, of and great slaves, sums huh? of money, to defray the charge of their journey by land. Wherefore the plunder got by this prize is not easily computed. Having taken all the treasure on board their own ship, and plundered their prize of everything else they either wanted or liked, they let her go. She, not being able to continue her voyage, returned back. As soon as the news came to the mogul, and he knew that they were English who robbed them, he threatened loud and talked of sending a mighty army with fire and sword to extirpate the English from all their settlements on the Indian coast. The East India Company in England were very much alarmed at it, however. Way to make by degrees, everywhere. they found means to pacify him by promising to do their endeavors to take the robbers and deliver them into his hands. However, the great noise this thing made in Europe, as well as India, was the occasion of all these romantic stories which were formed of Avery's greatness. In the meantime, our successful plunderers agreed to make the best of their way back to Madagascar intending to make that place their magazine of repository for all their treasure, and to build a small fortification there, and leave a few hands always ashore to look after it, and defend it from any attempts of the natives. But Avery put an end to this project, and made it altogether unnecessary. As they were steering their course, as has been said, he sends a boat on board of each of the sloops, desiring the chief of them to come on board of him in order to hold a council. They did so, and he told them that he had something to propose to them for the common good, 
which was to provide against accidents. He bade them consider the treasure they were possessed of would be sufficient for them all if they could secure it someplace on shore. Therefore, all they had to fear oh, yeah, was some misfortune or the voyage. He and bade them consider the consequences of being separated by bad weather, in which case the sloops, if either of them should fall in with any ship of force, must be either taken or sunk, and the treasure on board her lost to the rest. Beside the common accidents of the sea, as for his part, he was so strong, he was able to make his party good with any ship they were likely to meet in those seas, that if he met with any ship of such strength, that he could not take her, he was safe from being taken, being so well manned, beside his ship was a quick sailor, and could carry sail when the sloops could not. Wherefore, he proposed to them to put the treasure on board his ship, to seal up each oh, yeah, chest of three seals, whereof each was to keep one, and All to right. appoint a rendezvous in case of separation. Upon considering this proposal, it appeared so sensible to them that they readily came into it, for they argued to themselves well, that idea. an accident might happen to one of the sloops, and, and the other the escape. Right? Wherefore, it was for the common good. The thing was done as agreed to, the treasure put on board of Avery, and the chests sealed. They kept company that day and the next, the weather being fair, in which time Avery tampered with his men, telling them they now had sufficient to make all easy, and what should hinder them from going to some country where they were not known and living on shore all the rest of their days in plenty. They understood what he meant, and in short, they all agreed to bilk their new allies, the sloop's men. Nor do I find that any of them felt any qualms of honor rising in his stomach to hinder them from consenting to this piece of treachery. In fine, they took advantage of the darkness that night and steered another course, and by morning, lost sight of them. I leave the reader to judge yeah, and swear he had confusion there was among the sloop's men in the morning when they saw that Avery had given them the slip, for they knew by the fairness of the weather and the course they had agreed to steer that it must have been done on purpose. But we leave them at the present to follow Mr. Avery. End of chapter one, part one. Recording by Richard Kilmer, okay. Rio Medina, so, Texas. I trimmed it in length a bit. Let's see if that helps. And this one too. We're going to go into this end. Chapter one, part two of the general history of the pirates, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 1, Part 2. Avery and his men, having consulted what to do with themselves, came to a resolution to make the best of their way towards America, and none of them being known in those parts, they intended to divide the treasure, to change their names, to go ashore, some in one place, some in other, to purchase some settlements and live at ease. The first land they made was the island of Providence, then newly settled. Gotta have a little bit here they stayed here some time, and having considered that when they should go to New England, the greatness of their ship would cause much inquiry about them, and possibly some people from England who had heard the story of the ships being run away with from the groin, might suspect them to be the people. They therefore took a resolution of disposing of their ship at Providence, upon which Avery, pretending that the ship being fitted out upon the privateering account, and having no success, had received orders from the owners to dispose of her to the best advantage. He soon met with a purchaser, and immediately bought a sloop. In this sloop, he and his companions embarked. They touched at several parts of America, where no person suspected them, and some of them went on shore and dispersed themselves about the country, having received such dividends as Avery would give them. For he concealed the greatest part of the diamonds from them, which in the first hurry of plundering the ship, they did not much regard as not knowing their value. At length he came to Boston in New England, and seemed to have a desire of settling in those parts. 
and some of his companions went on shore there also. But he changed his resolution and proposed to the few of his companions who were left to sail for Ireland, which they consented to. He found out that New England was not a proper place for him because a great deal of his wealth lay in diamonds, and should he have produced them there, he would have certainly been seized on suspicion of piracy. In their voyage to Ireland, they avoided St. George's Channel, and sailing north about, oh, this is they it. put into now one I of the remember this. This is a very sad end for this guy. There, they disposed of their sloop, and coming on shore, mm -hmm. they separated themselves, some going to Cork, and some to Dublin, 18 of whom obtained their pardons afterwards of K. William. When Avery had remained some time in this kingdom, he was afraid to offer his diamonds to sail, lest an inquiry into his manner of coming by them should occasion a discovery. Henry Avery, I think Therefore, he comes to a bad end, right? so he gets taken what advantage was to be of done. He fancied so as soon as this is ready, I'm going to have to re-iron the first one I get on the larger temple. I put it down he to pass over into between England. an eighth and a quarter of an inch so. all the way around and to, going uh, to Devonshire, uh, get to fit he the sent one of these friends to meet him at a town called Biddeford. When he had communicated himself to his friends and consulted with him about the means of his effects, they agreed that the safest method would be to put them in the hands of some merchants who, being men of wealth and credit in the world, no inquiry would be made how they came by them. This friend telling him he was very intimate with some who were very fit for the purpose, and if he would but allow them a good commission, would do the business very faithfully. Avery liked the proposal, for he found no other way of managing his affairs, since he could not appear in them himself. Therefore, his friend going back to Bristol and opening the matter to the merchants, they made Avery a visit at Biddeford, where, after some protestations of honor and integrity, he delivered them his effects, consisting of diamonds and some vessels of gold. They gave him a little money for his present subsistence, and so they parted. He changed his name and lived in Biddeford without making any figure, and therefore there was no great notice taken of him. Yet, let one or two of his relations know where he was, who came to see him. In some time, his little money was spent, yet he heard nothing from his merchants. He writ to them often, and after much importunity, they sent him a small supply, but scarce Here's sufficient to pay his debts. In fine, the supplies they sent him from time to time were so small that they were not sufficient to give him bread. Nor could he get that little without a great deal of trouble and importunity. Wherefore, being weary of his life, he went privately to Bristol to speak to the merchants himself, where instead of money, he met a most shocking repulse. For when he desired them to come to an account with him, they silenced him by threatening to discover him, so that our merchants were as good pirates at land as he was at sea. Whether he was frightened by these menaces, or he had seen somebody else he thought knew him, is not known. But he went immediately over to Ireland, and from there solicited his merchants very hard for a supply, but to no purpose. For he was even reduced to beggary. In this extremity, he was resolved to return and cast himself upon them, let the consequences be what it would. He put himself on board a trading vessel, and worked his passage over to Plymouth, from whence he traveled on foot to Biddeford, where he had been but a few days before he fell sick and died, not being worth as much as would buy him a coffin. Thus have I given all that could be collected of any certain concerning this man, rejecting the idle stories which were made of his fantastic greatness, by which it appears that his actions were more inconsiderable than those of other pirates, since him, though he made more noise in the world. Now we shall turn back and give our readers some account of what became of the two sloops. We took notice of the rage and confusion which must have seized them upon their missing of Avery. However, they continued their course, some of them still flattering themselves that he had only outsailed them in the night, and that they should find him at the place of rendezvous. But when they came there and could hear no tidings of him, there was an end of hope. 
it was time to consider what they should do with themselves. Their stock of sea provisions was almost spent. And though there was rice and fish and fowl to be had ashore, yet these would not keep for sea without being properly cured with salt, which they had no conveniency of doing. Therefore, since they could not go on a cruising any more, it was time to think of establishing themselves at land, to which purpose they took all things out of the sloops and made tents of the sails and encamped themselves, having a large quantity of ammunition and abundance of small arms. Here they met with several of their countrymen, the crew of a privateer sloop, which was commanded by Captain Thomas II. And since it will be but a short digression, we will now give an account of how they came here. Captain George Dew and Captain Thomas II, having received commissions from then governor of Bermudas to sail directly for the river Gambia in Africa. There, with the advice and assistance of the agents of the Royal African Company, to attempt the taking of the French factory at Gori, lying upon that coast. In a few days after they had sailed out, Dew, in a violent storm, not only sprung his mast, but lost sight of his consort. Dew therefore returned back to refit, and two, instead of proceeding on his voyage, made for the Cape of Good Hope, and doubling the said Cape, shaped his course for the Straits of Babel Mandel, being the entrance into the Red Sea. Here he came up with a large ship, richly laden, bound from the Indies to Arabia, with 300 soldiers on board, besides seamen. Yet two had the hardiness to board her, and soon carried her, and, tis said by this prize, his men shared nearly 3,000 pounds apiece. They had intelligence from the prisoners of five other rich ships to pass that way, which two would have attacked, though they were very strong if they had not been overruled by the quartermaster and others. This differing of opinion created some ill blood amongst them, so that they resolved to break up pirating, and no place was so fit to receive them as Madagascar. Hither they steered, resolving to live on shore and enjoy what they got. As for Tu himself, he with a few others in a short time went off to Rhode Island, from whence he made his peace. Thus we have accounted for the company of our pirates met with here. It must be observed that the natives of Madagascar are a kind of Negroes. They differ from those of Guinea in their hair, which is long, and their complexion is not so good a jet. They have innumerable little princes among them who are continually making war upon one another. Their prisoners are their slaves, and they either sell them or put them to death as they please. When our pirates first settled amongst them, the alliance was much courted by these princes, so they sometimes joined one, sometimes another. But wheresoever they sided, they were sure to be victorious, for the Negroes here had no firearms nor did they understand their use, so that at length these pirates became so terrible to the Negroes that if two or three of them were only seen on one side when they were going to engage, the opposite side would fly without striking a blow. By these means they not only became feared but powerful. All the prisoners of war they took to be their slaves. They married the most beautiful of the Negro women, not one or two, but as many of them as they liked so that every one of them had as great a seralia as the grand seer at Constantinople. Their slaves they employed in planting rice, in fishing, hunting, and etc. Besides which, they had abundance of others who lived, as it were, under their protection. And to be secure from the disturbances or attacks of their powerful neighbors, they seemed to pay them a willing homage. Now they began to divide from one another, each living with his own wives, slaves, and dependents, like a separate prince. And as power and plenty naturally beget contention, they sometimes quarreled with one another, and attacked each other at the head of their several armies. And in these civil wars, many of them were killed. But an accident happened, which obliged them to unite again for their common safety. It must be observed, that these sudden great men had used their power like tyrants. They grew wanton in cruelty, and nothing was more common than upon the slightest displeasure to 
to cause one of their dependents to be tied to a tree and shot through the heart. Let the crime be what it would, whether little or great, this was always the punishment. Wherefore the Negroes conspired together to rid themselves of these destroyers all in one night. And as they now lived separate, the thing might easily have been done had not a woman who had been wife or concubine to one of them run nearly 20 miles in three hours to discover the matter to them. Immediately upon the alarm, they ran together as fast as they could, so that when the Negroes approached them, they found them all up in arms, wherefore they retired without making any attempt. The escape made them very cautious from that time, and it will be worthwhile to describe the policy of these brutish fellows and to show what measures they took to secure themselves. They found that fear of their power could not secure them against the surprise, and the bravest man may be killed when he is asleep by one much as inferior in courage and strength. Therefore, as their first security, they did all they could to foment war betwixt the neighboring Negroes, remaining neuter themselves, by which means those who were overcome constantly fled to them for protection, otherwise they must be either killed or made slaves. They strengthened their party and tied some to them by interest. When there was no war, they contrived to spirit up private quarrels among them and upon every little dispute or misunderstanding, push on one side or the other to revenge, instruct them how to attack or surprise their adversaries and lend them loaded pistols or firelocks to dispatch them with. The consequence of which was that the murderer was forced to fly to them for safety of his life with his wives, children, and kindred. Such as these were fast friends, and their lives depended upon the safety of his protectors. For as we observed before, our pirates were grown so terrible that none of their neighbors had resolution enough to attack them in an open war. By such arts as these, in the space of a few years, their body was greatly increased. They then began to separate themselves and remove at a greater distance from one another for the convenience of more ground, and were divided by Jews into tribes, each carrying with him his wives and children, of which by this time they had a large family, and also their quota of dependents and followers, and if power and command be the thing which distinguish a prince, these ruffians had all the marks of royalty about them, nay more. They had the very fears which commonly disturb tyrants, as may be seen by the extreme caution they took in fortifying the places where they dwelt. In this plan of fortification, they imitated one another. Their dwellings were rather citadels than houses. They made choice of a place overgrown with wood and situated near a water. They raised a rampart or high ditch round it, so straight and high that it was impossible to climb it especially by those who had not the use of scaling ladders. Over the stitch, there was one passage into the wood, and the dwelling, which was a hut, was built in that part of the wood, which the prince who inhabited it thought fit, but so covered that it could not be seen till you came at it. But the greatest cunning lay in the passage which led to the hut, which was so narrow that no more than one person could go abreast, and contrived in such an intricate manner that it was a perfect maze or labyrinth, it being round and round with several little crossways, so that a person that was not well acquainted with the way might walk several hours round and cross these ways without being able to find the hut. Moreover, all along the sides of these narrow paths, certain large thorns which grew upon a tree in that country were struck into the ground with their points uppermost, and the path itself being made crooked and serpentine. If a man should attempt to come near the hut at night, he would certainly have struck upon these thorns, though he had been provided with that clue which Ariadne gave to Theseus when he entered the cave of the Minotaur. Thus tyrant-like they lived, fearing and like fearing. Classical and reference in this situation, they were found by Captain Woods Rogers when he went to Madagascar in the Delicia, a ship of 40 guns, with the design of buying slaves in order to sell to the Dutch at Batavia or New Holland. 
He happened to touch upon a part of the island where no ship had been seen for seven or eight years before. When he met with some of the pirates, at which time they had been upon the island above twenty-five years, having a large motley generation of children and grandchildren descended from them, there being about that time eleven of them remaining alive. Upon their first seeing a ship of this force and burthen, they supposed it to be a man of war sent to take them. Therefore they lurked within their fastness. But when some from the ship came ashore without any show of hostility and offering to trade with the Negroes, they ventured to come out of their holes, attended like princes, since they actually are kings de facto, which is a kind of right. We ought to speak of them as such. Having been so many years upon this island, it may be imagined their clothes had long been worn out, so that their majesties were extremely out at the elbows. I cannot well, say that they were ragged, since they had no clothes. They had nothing and, to cover them, well, but with the skins of beasts, without any tanning, the elbows, but with all the hair on, the nor a shoe, nor stocking. So they looked like the picture of Hercules in the lion's skin, and being overgrown with beard and hair upon their bodies, they appeared the most savage figures that a man's imagination can frame. However, they soon got rigged, for they sold great numbers of those poor people under them for clothes, knives, saws, powder and ball, and many other things, and became so familiar that they went aboard the Delicia, and were observed to be very curious examining the inside of the ship and very familiar with the men inviting them ashore their design in doing this as they afterward confessed was to try if it was not practical to surprise the ship in the night which they judged very easy in case there was but a slender watch kept on board they having boats and men enough at command but it seems the captain was aware of them and kept so strong a watch upon deck that they found it was in vain to make any attempt. Wherefore, when some of the men went ashore, they were for inveigling them and drawing them into a plot, for seizing the captain and securing the rest of the men under the hatches, when they should have the night watch, promising the signal to come on board to join them, proposing, if they succeeded, to go a pirating together, not doubting, but with that ship, they should be able to take anything they met on the sea. But the captain, observing an intimacy growing betwixt them and some of his men, thought it could be for no good, and therefore he broke it off in time, not suffering them so much as to talk together. And when he sent a boat on shore with an officer to treat with them about the sale of slaves, the crew remained on board the boat, and no man was suffered to talk with them, but the person deputed by him for that purpose. Before he sailed away, and they found that nothing was to be done, they confessed all the designs they had formed against him. Thus he left them as he found them, in a great deal of dirty state and royalty, but with fewer subjects than they had, having, as we observed, sold many of them. And if ambition be the darling passion of men, no doubt they were happy. One of these great princes had formerly been a waterman upon the Thames, where having committed a murder, he fled to the West Indies, and was a number of those who ran away with the sloops. The rest had been all foremast men, nor was there a man amongst them who could either read or write, and yet their secretaries of state had no more learning than themselves. This is all the account we can give of these kings of Madagascar, some of whom it is probable are reigning to this day. What if there's any remaining End of chapter of one, Part two. Recorded by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. You should look that up. Have, have there been any excavations on Madagascar to see if you could locate where these places were? Chapter 2 of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Turritson. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. Chapter 2 of Captain Martell and His Crew. I come now to the pirates that have rose since the Peace of Utrecht, 
In wartime, there is no room for any because all those of a roving, adventurous disposition find employment in privateers, so there is no opportunity for pirates. Like our mobs in London, when they come to any height, our superiors order out the train bands, and when once they are raised, the others are suppressed, of course. I take the reason of it to be that the mob go into the tame army and immediately from notorious breakers of the peace become, by being put into order, solemn preservers of it. And should our legislators put some of the pirates into authority, it would not only lessen their number, but I imagine set them upon the rest and they would be the likeliest people to find them out according to the proverb, set a thief to catch a thief. To bring this about, there needs no other encouragement but to give all the effects taken aboard a pirate vessel to the captors. For in case of plunder and gain, they like it as well from friends as enemies, but are not fond, as things are carried, of ruining poor fellows, say the Creolians, with no advantage to themselves. The multitude of men and vessels employed this way in a time of war in the West Indies is another reason for the number of pirates in a time of peace. This cannot be supposed to be a reflection on any of our American governments, much less on the king himself, by whose authority such commissions are granted. Because of the reasonableness and absolute necessity there is for the doing of it, Yet the observation is just for so many idle people employing themselves in privateers for the sake of plunder and riches, which they always spend as fast as they get. For when the war is over and they can have no farther business in the way of life they have been used to, they too readily engage in acts of piracy, which being but the same practice without a commission, they make very little distinction betwixt the lawfulness of one and the unlawfulness of the other. I have not inquired so far back of, as to know the original uh, of this rumor, of but I believe he and his gang, gang were some privateers men belonging to the island of Jamaica in the preceding war. Is it his story is but short, for his reign was so, and him having been put to his adventures in good time when he was growing strong and formidable. We find him commander of a pirate sloop of eight guns and eighty men, in the month of September 1716, cruising off Jamaica, Cuba, etc., about which time he took the Berkeley galley, Captain Saunders, and plundered him of 1,000 pounds in money, and afterwards met with a sloop called the King Solomon, for which he took some money and provisions, besides goods, to a good value. They proceeded after this to the port of Cavana, at the island of Cuba, and in their way took two sloops, which they plundered and let go, and off the port fell in with a fine galley with twenty guns called the John and Martha, Captain Wilson, which they attacked under the piratical black flag and made yes, themselves the masters. Yes, the piratical black flag! They put some of the men ashore, and others they detained, as they had done several times, to increase their company. But Captain Martell charged Captain Wilson to advise his owners that their ship would answer his purpose exactly. By taking one deck down, and as for the cargo, which consisted chiefly of logwood and sugar, he would take care it should be carried to a good market. Having fitted up the aforesaid ship as they designed, they mounted her with 22 guns, 100 men, and left 25 hands in the sloop, and so proceeded to cruise off the Leeward Islands, where they met with but too much success. After the taking of the sloop and a brigantine, they gave chase to a stout ship, which they came up with, and at sight of the pirate's flag, she struck to the robbers, being a ship of 20 guns called the Dolphin, bound for Newfoundland. Captain Martell made the men prisoners and carried the ship with him. The middle of December, the pirates took another galley in her voyage home from Jamaica, called the Kent, Captain Lawton, and shifted her provisions aboard their own ship and let her go, which obliged her to sail back to Jamaica for a supply for her voyage. After this, they met with a small ship and a sloop belonging to Barbados. Out of both, they took provisions and then parted with them, having first taken out some of their hands who were willing to be forced to go along with them. The Greyhound Galley of London, Captain Evans, 
from Guinea to Jamaica was the next that had the misfortune to fall in their way, which they did not detain long, for as soon as they could get out all of her gold dust, elephant's teeth, and forty slaves, they sent her onwards upon her voyage. They concluded now that it was high time to get into harbor and refit, as well as to get refreshments themselves, and wait an opportunity to dispose of their cargo. Therefore it was resolved to make the best of their way to Santa Crux, a small island in the latitude of 18, 30 north, 10 mile long and two broad, lying southeast of Puerto Rico, belonging to the French settlements. Here they thought they might lie privately for some time and fit themselves for further mischief. They met with a sloop by the way, which they took along with them, and in the beginning of the year 1716 to 17, they arrived at their port, having a ship of 20 guns, a sloop of eight, and three prizes, viz. another ship of 20 guns, a sloop of four guns, and another sloop last taken. With this little fleet, they got into a small harbor, a road, the northwest part of the island, and warped up two creeks, which were made by a little island lying in the bay. I am the more particular now, because I shall take leave of the gentlemen at this place. Okay. They had here bare 16 foot water at the deepest, and but 13 okay. or 14 at the shallowest, uh, and nothing but rocks and sands without which secured them from the wind and sea, and likewise from the inconceivable force coming against them. When they had all got in, the first thing they had to do was to guard themselves in the best manner they could. They made a battery of four guns upon the island, and another battery of two guns on the north point of the road, and warped in one of the sloops with eight guns at the mouth of the channel to hinder any vessels from coming in. No. When this was no, done, they went to work on their ship, the unrigging and unloading, Let's go to clean, where I shall leave them a while till I bring other company to them. In the month of November 1716, General Hamilton, commander in chief of all the Leeward Caribbean Islands, sent a sloop express to Captain Hume at Barbados, commander of His Majesty's ship, Scarborough, of 30 guns and 140 men, to acquaint him that the two pirate sloops of 12 guns each molested the colonies, having plundered several vessels. The Scarborough had buried 20 men and had near 40 sick, and therefore was but in ill state to go to sea. However, Captain Hume left his sick men behind and sailed to the other islands for a supply of men, taking 20 soldiers from Antigua. At Nevis he took 10, and 10 at St. Christopher's, and then sailed to the island of Anguilla, where he learned and some time before, two such sloops had been at Spanish Town, otherwise called one of the Virgin Islands. Accordingly, the next day, the Scarborough came to Spanish Town, but could hear no news of the sloops, only that they had been there Hello. about Christmas, it hey, being about the 15th of January. Captain Hume, finding no Hello. account could be had of these pirates, decided to go back the next day to Barbados. But it happened that night, that a boat anchored there from Santa Crux and informed him that he saw a pirate ship of 22 or 24 guns with other vessels going into the northwest part of the island of Forsyth. The Scarborough weighed immediately and the next morning came in sight of the rovers and their prizes and stood to them, but the pilot refused to venture in with the ship. All the while the pirates fired red hot bullets from the shore. At length, the ship came to an anchor alongside the reef near the channel and cannonaded for several hours, both the vessels and batteries. About four in the afternoon, the sloop that guarded the channel was sunk by the shot of the man of war. Then she cannonaded the pirate ship of 22 guns that lay behind the island. The next night, viz. the 18th, it falling calm, Captain Hume weighed fearing he might fall on the reef, and so stood off and on for a day or two to block them up. On the 20th, in the evening, they observed the man of war to stand off to sea, and took the opportunity to warp out in order to slip away from the island. But at 12 o'clock they run aground, and then seeing the Scarborough about, standing in again as their case was desperate, so they were put into the utmost confusion. They quitted the 
the ship and set her on fire with 20 Negroes in her who were all burnt. 19 of the pirates made their escape in a small sloop, but the captain and the rest with 20 Negroes betook to the woods where it was probable they might starve, for we never heard what became of them afterwards. Captain Hume released the prisoners with the ship and sloop that remained, and then went after the two pirate sloops first mentioned. There's End of chapter two. A template and piece, two pieces of tape. And we will attach these chapter all three, these part one. Of the general of history of the pirates, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information yes. or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Huh. Okay. Recording by Rain. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 3, Part 1. Okay. Of Captain Teach, alias Blackbeard. Right. Edward Teach was a Bristol man born, but had sailed some time out of Jamaica in privateers in the late French War. Yet though he had often distinguished himself for his uncommon boldness and personal courage, he was never raised to any command till he went to pirating, which I think was at the latter end of the year 1716, when Captain Benjamin Hornigold put him into a sloop that he had made prize of, and with whom he continued in consortship till a little while before Hornigold surrendered. In the spring of the year 1717, the, uh, Teach and Hornigold sailed from Providence for the Maine of America, and took in their way a billet from the Havana, with 120 barrels of flour, as also a sloop from Bermuda, third bar master, from whom they took only some gallons of wine and then let him go, and a ship from Madeira to South Carolina, out of which they got plunder to a considerable value. After cleaning on the coast of Virginia, they returned to the West Indies, and in the latitude of 24, made a prize of a large French guinea man bound to Martinico, which by Hornigold's okay. consent, so Teach went aboard of his captain and took a cruise in her. Hornigold returned with his sloop to Providence, so where at the arrival of right? Captain Rogers, the governor, he yeah. surrendered to mercy, pursuant to the king's proclamation. Aboard of this guinea man, Teach mounted 40 guns and named her the Queen Anne's Revenge. And cruising near the island of St. Vincent, took a large ship called the Great Allen, Christopher Taylor commander. The pirates plundered her of what they thought fit, put all the men ashore upon the island above mentioned, and then set fire to the ship. A few days after, Teach fell in with the Scarborough man of war, of 30 guns, who engaged him for some hours. But she, finding the pirate well manned and having tried her strength, gave over the engagement and returned to Barbados, the place of her station, and Teach sailed towards the Spanish America. In his way, he met with a pirate sloop of 10 guns, commanded by one Major Bonnet, lately a gentleman of good reputation and estate in the island of Barbados, whom he joined. But in a few days after, Teach, finding that Bonnet knew nothing of a maritime life, with the consent of his own men, put in another captain, one Richards, to command Bonnet's sloop, and took the major on board his own ship, telling him that as he had not been used to the fatigue and care of such a post, it would be better for him to decline it, and live easy and at his pleasure, in such a ship as his, where he should not be obliged to perform duty, but follow his own inclinations. At Turniff, ten leagues short of the Bay of Honduras, the pirates took in fresh water, and while they were at anchor there, they saw a sloop coming in, whereupon Richards in the sloop called the Revenge slipped his cable and run out to meet her, who upon seeing the black flag hoisted, struck his sail and came flag to the stern of Teach the Commodore. Perfect. She was called the Adventure from Jamaica, David ah, Harry, that's a master. Good name. They took him and his men aboard the great ship and sent a number of other okay, hands so with Israel Hand, master of Teach's ship, Let's to man the sloop for the piratical account. The 9th of April they weighed from Turniff, having laid there about a week, and sailed to the bay, where they found a ship and four sloops. Three of the latter belonged to Jonathan Bernard of Jamaica, and the other to Captain James. The ship was of Boston, called the Protestant Caesar, Captain Wire Commander. Teach hoisted his black colors and fired a gun, upon which Captain Wire and his men left their colors. ship and got ashore in their boat. That's the way you start, Teach's right? quartermaster and eight of his crew took possession of Wire's ship, and Richards secured all the sloops, one of which they burnt out of spite to the owner. Ah, the Protestant Caesar they also burnt, after they had plundered her, 
because she belonged to Boston, where some men had been hanged for piracy. Oh. And the three slips belonged to the bar they let go. From hence the rovers sailed to Turkill, and then to the Grand Caymans, a small island about thirty leagues to the westward of Jamaica, where they took a small turtler, and so to the Havana, and from thence to the Bahama wrecks, and from the Bahama wrecks, they sailed to Carolina, the taking That's a brigantine a and two sloops in their way, dive, right? where they lay off the bar of Charlestown for five or six days. They took here a ship as she was coming out, bound for London, commanded by Robert Clark, with some passengers on board for England. The next day they took another vessel coming out of Charlestown, and also two pinks coming into Charlestown. Likewise a brigantine with fourteen negroes aboard, all which being done in the face of the town, struck a great terror to the whole province of Carolina, having just before been visited by Bain, another notorious pirate, that they oh, abandoned Bain. themselves to despair, being in no condition to resist their force. They were eight sail in the harbor ready for the sea, but none dared to venture out, it being almost impossible to escape their hands. The inward bound vessels were under the same unhappy dilemma, so that the trade of this place was totally interrupted. What made these misfortunes heavier to them was a long expensive war the colony had had with the natives, which was but just ended when these robbers infested them. Is that King Philip's war? Teach detained all the ships and prisoners, and being in want of medicines, resolves to demand the chest from the government of the province. Accordingly, Richards, the captain of the revenge sloop, with two or three more pirates, were sent up along with Mr. Marks, one of the prisoners, whom they had taken in Clark's ship, and very insolently made their demands threatening that if they did not send immediately the chest of medicines and let the pirate ambassadors return without offering any violence to their persons, they would murder all their prisoners, send up their heads to the governor, and set the ships they had taken oh. on fire. Whilst oh, Mr. Ooh. Marks was making application to the council, Richards and the rest of the pirates walked the streets publicly in the sight of all people who were fired with the utmost indignation, looking upon them as robbers and murderers, and particularly the authors of their wrongs and oppressions, but durst not so much as think of executing their revenge for fear of bringing more calamities upon themselves. And so they were forced to let the villains pass with impunity. The government were not long in deliberating upon the message, though twas the greatest affront that could have been put upon them. Yet for the saving so many men's lives, among them Mr. Samuel Wragg, one of the council, they complied with the necessity and sent aboard a chest valued at between three and four hundred pounds, and the pirates went back safe to their ships. Okay, so Beard, I have this for so teach was generally next. called, as we shall hereafter show, as soon as he had received the medicines and his brother rogues, let go the ships and the prisoners, having first taken out of them in gold and silver about fifteen hundred pounds sterling, besides provisions and other matters. From the bar of Charlestown they sailed to North Carolina, Captain Teach and the ship which they called the Man of War, Captain Richards and Captain Hands and the sloops, which they termed privateers, and another sloop serving them as a tender. Teach began now to think of breaking up the company and securing the money and the best of the effects for himself and some others of his companions he had most friendship for, and to cheat the rest. Accordingly, on pretense of running into Topsail Inlet to clean, he grounded his ship, and then, as if it had been done undesignedly and by accident, he orders Hans a sloop to come to his assistance and get him off again, which he, endeavoring to do, ran the sloop on shore near the other, and so were both lost. This done, Teach goes into the tender sloop with forty hands and leaves the revenge there, then takes seventeen others and maroons them no. on a small sandy island about a league from the main, no. where there was neither bird, beast, or herb for their subsistence, and where they must have perished if Major Bonnet had not two days later no. taken them off. Okay. Teach goes up to the governor of North Carolina with about 20 of his men, surrenders to his majesty's proclamation, and receives certificates thereof from his excellency. But it did not appear that their submitting to this pardon was from any reformation of manners, but only to wait a more favorable opportunity to play the same game over again, which he soon after effected with greater security to himself and with much better prospect of success, having in this time cultivated a very good understanding with Charles Eden, Esquire, the governor above mentioned. The first piece of service this kind governor did to Blackbeard okay. was to give him a right to the vessel which he had taken when he was a pirating in the great ship called Queen Anne's Revenge, for which purpose a court of vice-admiralty was held at Bathtown, 
and though Teach had never any commission in his life, well, and the sloop uh, belonging to the English merchants had taken Carolina, in time South of Carolina. peace, yet was she condemned as a prize taken from the Spaniards by the said Teach. These proceedings show that governors are but men. Before he sailed upon his adventures, he married a young creature of about 16 years of age, the governor performing the ceremony. As it is a custom to marry here by a priest, so it is there by a magistrate. And this, I have been informed, made teach his 14th wife, whereof about a dozen might still be living. His behavior in this state was something extraordinary, for while his sloop lay in Oquacoke Inlet, and he ashore at a plantation where his wife lived, with whom, after he had lain all night, it was his custom to invite five or six of his brutal companions to come ashore, and he would force her to prostitute herself to them all, one after another, before his face. In June 1718, he went to sea upon another expedition and steered his course toward Bermudas. He met with two or three English vessels in his way, but robbed them only of provisions, stores, and other necessities for his present expense. But near the island aforementioned, he fell in with two French ships, one of them was loaded with sugar and cocoa, and the other light, both bound to Martinico. The ship that had no lading he let go, and putting all the men of the loaded ship aboard her, he brought home the other with her cargo to North Carolina, where the governor and the pirates shared the plunder. When Teach and his prize arrived, he and four of his crew went to his excellency and made affidavit that they found the French ship at sea without a soul on board her, and then a court was called and the ship condemned. The governor had sixty hogsheads of sugar for his dividend, and one Mr. Knight, who was his secretary and collector for the province, twenty, and the rest was shared among the other pirates. The business was not yet done, the ship remained, and it was possible one or other might come into the river that might be acquainted with her, and so discover the roguery. But Teach thought of a contrivance to prevent this, for upon a pretense that she was leaky and that she might sink, and so stop up the mouth of the inlet or cove where she lay, he obtained an order from the governor to bring her out into the river and set her on fire, which was accordingly executed, and she was burnt down to the water's edge, her bottom sunk, and with it, their fears of her ever rifing in judgment against them. Captain Teach, alias Blackbeard, passed three or four months in the river, sometimes lying at anchor in the coves, at other times sailing from one inlet to another, trading with such sloops as he met for the plunder he had taken and would often give them presents for stores and provisions took from them, that is, when he happened to be in a giving humor. At other times he made bold with them and took what he liked, without saying, by your leave, knowing well they dared not send him a bill for the payment. He often diverted himself with going ashore among the planters, where he reveled night and day. By these he was well received, but whether out of love or fear I cannot say. Sometimes he used them courteously enough and made them presents of rum and sugar in recompense of what he took from them. But as for liberties, which tis said he and his companions often took with the wives and daughters of the planters, I cannot take upon me to say whether he paid them ad valorem or no. At other times he carried it in a lordly manner towards them and would lay some of them under contribution. Nay, he often proceeded to bully the governor not that I can discover the least cause of quarrel betwixt them, but it seemed only to be done to shew he dared do it. The sloops trading up and down this river, being so frequently pillaged yeah, by so the Blackbeard, consulted with the traders and some of the best planters what course to take. They saw plainly it would be in vain to make any application to the governor of North Carolina, to whom it properly belonged to find some redress, so that if they could not be relieved from some other quarter, Blackbeard would be like to reign with impunity. Therefore, with as much secrecy as possible, they sent a deputation to Virginia to lay the affair before the governor of that colony and to solicit an armed force from the men of war lying there to take or destroy this pirate. This governor consulted with the captains of the two men of war, these the Pearl and Lime, who had lain in St. James's River about ten months. It was agreed that the governor should hire a couple of small sloops and the men of war should man them. This was accordingly done, and the command of them given to Mr. Robert Maynard, first lieutenant of the Pearl, an experienced officer and a gentleman of great bravery and resolution, as will appear by his gallant behavior in this expedition. The sloops were well manned and furnished with ammunition and small arms, but had no guns mounted. About the time of their going out, the governor called an assembly in which it was resolved to publish a proclamation offering certain rewards to any person or persons 
who within a year after that time should take or destroy any pirate. The original proclamation being in our hands is as follows. By His Majesty's Lieutenant Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the Colony and Dominion of Virginia, a proclamation publishing the rewards given for apprehending or killing pirates. Whereas, by an act of assembly made at a session of assembly begun at the Capitol in Williamsburg, the 11th day of November, in the fifth year of His Majesty's reign, entitled, An Act to Encourage the Apprehending and Destroying of Pirates. It is, amongst other things enacted, that all and every person or persons who, from and after the 14th day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1,718, and before the 14th day of November, which shall be in the year of our Lord, 1,719, shall take any pirate or okay. pirates on the sure. sea or land, I think or we're ready to start shall kill any such pirate or pirates between the degrees of 34 and 39 of northern latitude, and within 100 leagues of the continent of Virginia, or within the provinces of Virginia or North How Carolina, long is a league? upon the conviction or making due proof of the killing of all and every such pirate and pirates, before the governor and council, shall be entitled to have and receive out of the public money in the hands of the treasurer of this colony, the several rewards following. That is to say, for Edward Teach, commonly called Captain Teach, or Blackbeard, 100 pounds. Ooh. For every other commander of a Pricey. pirate ship, sloop, or vessel, 40 pounds. Oh my gosh, three For really lieutenant, master, or okay. master, bosun, or carpenter, okay, 20 so. pounds. For every other inferior officer, 15 pounds. And, and for it. every private man taken on board such ship, sloop, or vessel, 10 pounds. And that for every pirate, which shall be taken by any ship, sloop, or vessel belonging to this colony, or North Carolina, within the time aforesaid, in any place whatsoever, the life rewards shall be paid according to the quality and condition of such pirates. Wherefore, right. for the encouragement of all such persons as shall be so willing to serve his majesty and their country in so just and honorable an undertaking as the suppressing a sort of people of who may be truly called enemies to mankind, I have thought fit with the advice and consent of his majesty's council to issue this proclamation, hereby declaring the said rewards shall be punctually and justly paid mm -hmm. in current money of Virginia, according to the directions of said act. And I do I'm order and appoint this proclamation so, to be published by the sheriffs at their respective county <coughs> houses and by all ministers and readers in the several churches and chapels throughout this colony. Given at our council chamber at Williamsburg on the 24th day of November, 1718, in the fifth year of His Majesty's reign. God save the king. A. Spotswood. <laughs> Alexander Spotswood. End of chapter right. 3, part 1. This is a fantastic book. This Chapter is a, three, this LibriVox uh, recording is really neat. I don't know much about them, but one. other than this, this is a but it sounds like it's an organization that recordings are in the public just domain. records audiobooks. For more information is or to volunteer, really cool. please it's, visit it's LibriVox.org. Here's some of these really cool stories. Recording by Rain. I guess it'd be, you know, like the general history of the like pirates, this, volume one, or, by Charles Johnson. Doing something else. This Chapter is three, part two. Um, the 17th of November, 1718, the lieutenant sailed from Kikitan in James River. We're going to pause that for a moment. I'm going to check something here. It's 330. Let's see what's going on here. So I've got my needle threaded. I've got my bones uh, pinned to the fabric, or to the flag. And uh, we're going to see what happens here to get them... Uh, Get them all stitched down.
Cool. <sighs> All right. I'd like to see some. Uh, oops. I'd like to see some videos on weathering techniques for fabrics. We were at an event one time, and uh, this lady had, she was portraying a character in first person. She had beautifully destroyed clothing. And uh, she spent, I don't know, maybe half an hour talking to us about how, how she had done it. You know, once we were just talking about how to make the stuff. And uh, she told about using, she used pieces of brick to abrade the stuff, and tea and coffee to stain it. and various things so I'm going to see about um, I, want, I want to put some weather and wear on these I don't want to make them look trashed but but I want some uh, I want to tell a story I want these to have been sailed through the Caribbean and um, you know hit with a hurricane and maybe suffered a battle or two maybe some some battle scars and I, want to, I don't want a whole lot of damage but 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 some some history to it so I'm kind of thinking about that right now as I'm uh, sort of finishing them up or getting toward finishing them. Once I get all the bones on them, they're built and then it's just uh, painting the shadows on and uh, and then it's really into uh, adding the wear and the weather. This is going to be the fun part. Like, I mean, it's all kind of fun, but but the the, the weather and wear and the shadowing and stuff, that's, that's the cool fun part. And cut them to pieces. <sighs> Whereupon, under the smoke of one of the bottles and just mentioned, let's put the camera on so we see the stitching. The bowels of Maynard's sloop. How about that? And were not seen by him till the air cleared. However, he just then gave a signal to his men, who all rose in an instant and attacked the pirates with as much bravery as ever was done upon such an occasion. Oh, Blackbeard and the lieutenant boss. fired the first pistol at each other, by which the pirate received a wound, and then engaged with the swords till the lieutenants unluckily broke. And stepping back to cock a pistol, Blackbeard with his cutlass was striking at that instant that one of Maynard's men gave him a terrible wound in the neck and throat, by which the lieutenant came off with a small cut over his fingers. They were now closely and warmly engaged, the lieutenant and twelve men against Blackbeard and oh, Scout, till the sea was tinctured with blood round the vessel. Oh my gosh. Blackbeard received a, a shot here. into his body from the pistol that Lieutenant Maynard discharged, yet he stood his ground and fought with great fury, till he received five and twenty wounds, and five of them by shot. At length, as he was cocking another pistol, having fired several before, I want to see that dead, battle, and I think I'm going to illustrate By which time, eight of the fourteen dropped, and all the rest, much wounded, jumped overboard, and called out for quarters, I think I'm going granted, to paint that. Though it was only prolonging their lives for a few scene. days. I, in fact, I think, the sloop you know, I think I'm going to illustrate this book. The Blackbeard's sloop with equal bravery, so they I want to illustrate the general quarters. history of the pirates. Here was an end I hear these stories, 
I, I've read the, the for a I, hero. I've listened to this Libra box recording several times while I, while I was out working in the field of painting and stuff. Um, was entirely owing to the I, I've of read the book, I have a hard copy of the, uh, the paper who might have book downstairs much less loss, that I've read and a couple of times. With great guns. I really like it, and they were obliged to use small it's so evocative. The holes and places he lurked in vivid. Would not admit I just want to illustrate some of these things. And it was no I'm small not really an illustrator. For this to get to him. Not by training. Having grounded really. his vessel at least a hundred times and getting up the river, scenes. besides other discouragements, enough to so have turned back any that. gentleman without dishonor who was less resolute and bold than this lieutenant. Yes, dear. The broadside, Why are you scratching so my chair? Before they boarded, in all probability, saved mean? the rest from destruction. For before that, Teach had little or no hopes of escaping, and therefore had posted a resolute fellow. A negro whom he had brought up with a lighted match in the powder room with commands to blow up when he should give him orders which was as soon as the lieutenant and his men could have entered that so he might have destroyed his conquerors and when the negro found out how it went with blackbeard he could hardly be persuaded from the rash action by two prisoners that were then in the hold of the sloop what seems a little odd is that some of these men who behaved so bravely against blackbeard went afterwards a-pirating themselves, oh. and one of them was taken along with Roberts. Wow. But I do not find that any of them were provided for, except one that was hanged. But hmm. this is a digression. The lieutenant caused Blackbeard's head to be severed from his body, and hung up at the bolt spread end. I think Blackbeard was only like 28 or something when he was killed. Men. He wasn't even old. It must be observed that in rummaging the pirate sloop, I always imagine him as an older guy, but papers, he wasn't that old. the correspondence betwixt Governor Eden, the secretary and collector, oh, Governor and Eden. also traders at New York, and Blackbeard. It is likely he had regard enough for his friends to have destroyed these papers before the action in order to hinder them from falling into such hands where the discovery would be of no use either to the interest or reputation of these fine gentlemen if it had not been his fixed resolution to have blown up together when he found no possibility of escaping. When the lieutenant came to Bath Town, he made bold to seize in the governor's storehouse the 60 hogsheads of sugar and from honest Mr. Knight, 20, which it seems was their dividend of the plunder taken in the French ship. Look at this. All right, we've got a good start on these bones. shameful discovery for being apprehensive that he might be called to an account for these trifles, fell sick with the fright and died in a few days. Oh, no. After the wounded men were pretty well recovered, the lieutenant sailed back to the men of war in James River in Virginia, with Blackbeard's head fell still hanging at the, the bolts for end, and 15 prisoners, 13 of whom were hanged. It appearing upon trial that one of them, <sighs> V. Samuel O'Dell, was taken out of the trading sloop but the night before the engagement. This poor fellow was a little unlucky at his first entering upon his new trade, there appearing no less than 70 wounds upon him after the action, mm -hmm. notwithstanding which he lived and That's was cured of them all. The other person that escaped the so, gallows was one Israel yeah. Hands, the master of Blackbeard's sloop, and formerly no, no, no. the same, Do not. before the Queen Anne's revenge was lost in Topsail Inlet. Do not jump up the here. The aforesaid Hands happened not to no. be in the fight, but was Please taken afterwards ashore in Bath Town. Having been some time before disabled by Blackbeard okay, so in one of his savage humors, after the following manner. I'm going to pull these pins as I go. Where's my hands, pin box? The pilot and another man. Oh, let's put it there. Blackbeard, right without any provocation, privately draws out a small pair of pistols and cocks them under the table, which being perceived by the man, he withdrew and went up on deck, leaving hands Let us the make a hell of our own. Together. When the pistols were ready, he says. they blew out the candle. And crossing his hands, he discharged them at his company. Hands, the master, was shot through the knee and lame for life. The other pistol did no execution. Being asked the meaning of this, he only answered by damning them that if he did not now and then kill one of them, they would forget who he was. Hands being taken was tried and condemned. No, but just as he was sweetheart. about to be executed, sweetheart. a ship this arrived at Virginia with a proclamation for prolonging the time of His Majesty's pardon to Wait, such of the pirates as should surrender. Okay, so so far so good. We've got the back side stitching up. Hands pleaded and the pardon. The front I was allowed to really of it. And, and is alive uh, at this time it seems to be laying flat and, and aligned properly, so now I'm just going to carry on. account of Teach's life and actions, it will not be amiss that we speak of his beard since it did not a little contribute towards making his name so terrible in those parts. Plutarch and other grave historians have taken notice that several great men amongst the Romans took their surnames 
from certain odd marks in their countenances. As Cicero from a mark or vetch on his nose, so our hero, Captain Teach, assumed the cognomen of Blackbeard from that large quantity of hair which, like a frightful meteor, covered his whole face and meteor. frightened America more than any comet that has appeared there a long time. Hmm. This beard was black, which he suffered to grow an extravagant length. As to breadth, it came up to his eyes. He was accustomed to twist it with ribbons in small tails after the manner of our Ramilly's wigs and turn them about huh. his ears. In time of action, he wore a sling over his shoulders with three brace of pistols hanging in holsters like bandoliers and stuck lighted matches under his hat, which appearing on each side of his face. His eyes naturally looking fierce and wild made him altogether such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of a fury from hell to look more frightful. If he had the look of a fury, his humors and passions were suitable to it. We shall relate two or three more of his extravagancies, which we omitted in the body of his history, by which it will appear to what a pitch of wickedness human nature may arrive if its passions are not checked. In the Commonwealth, I like that this book is a moral tale. The greatest length of wickedness is looked upon with a kind of envy it's amongst moral them, instruction. as a person of a more extraordinary gallantry and is thereby entitled to be distinguished by some post. It's thrilling, such a one but it's moral courage, instruction. It's like a Scorsese a movie. Man. You know, the hero uh, of whom we are writing was thoroughly accomplished this way. Violent and scary so morality plays. As if yeah. he aimed at making his men believe he was a devil incarnate. For being one day at sea, and a little flushed with drink, Come, says he, let us make a hell of our own, and try how long we can bear it. Accordingly, he, with two or three others, went down into the hold, and closing up all the hatches, filled several pots full of brimstone and other combustible matter, and set it on fire, and so continued till they were almost suffocated, when some of the men cried out for air. At length he opened the hatches, not a little pleased that he held out the longest. The night before he was killed, he sat up and drank till the morning with some of his own men and the master of a merchantman, and having had intelligence of the two sloops coming to attack him, as has before been observed. One of his men asked him, in case anything should happen to him in the engagement with the sloops, whether his wife knew where he had buried his money. He answered that nobody but himself and the devil knew where it was, and the longest liver should take all. Well... Those of his crew who were taken alive told a story which may appear a little incredible. However, we think it will not be fair to omit it since we had it from their Where own mouths. Where is it? Where is Blackbeard's treasure? That once upon a cruise, they found out they had a man on board more than their crew. Such a one was seen several days amongst them, sometimes below and sometimes upon deck, yet no man on the ship could give an account who he was or from whence he came, but that he disappeared a little before they were cast away in their great ship but it seems they verily believed it was the devil. One would think these things should induce them to reform their lives, it was. but so many reprobates together encouraged and spirited one another up in their wickedness, to which a continual course of drinking did not a little contribute. Mm -hmm. For in Blackbeard's journal, which was taken, there were several memorandums of the following nature, found writ with his own hand. Hmm. Such a day, rum all out. Our company somewhat sober. A damn confusion amongst us. Rogues applauding. Great talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize. Such a day took one with a great deal of liquor on board. So kept the company hot, damned hot, that all things went well again. Hmm. Thus it was these wretches passed Maybe their the lives action. with very little pleasure or satisfaction in the possession of what they violently took prizes. away from others. And sure to pay for it at last by an ignominious death. The names of the pirates killed in the engagement are as follow. Edward Teach, Commander. Philip Morton, Gunner. Hmm. Garrett Gibbons, Boson. Owen Roberts, Carpenter. Thomas Miller, Quartermaster. John Husk. Joseph Curtis. Joseph Brooks. Nathaniel Jackson. All the rest, except the two last, were wounded and afterwards hanged in Virginia. Wow. John Carnes. Joseph Brooks, James Blake, John Gills, Thomas Gates, James White, Richard Stiles, Caesar, Joseph Phillips, James Robbins, John Martin, Edward Salter, Stephen Daniel, Richard Greensale, Israel Hands Pardoned. 
Hmm. Samuel Odell acquitted. There were in the pirate sloops Why of the shore near where the sloops lay, 25 hogshead of sugar, 11 tierces and 145 bags of cocoa, How much is a tears? barrel of indigo, and a bale of cotton, which, with what was taken from the governor and secretary, and the sale of the sloop, came to 2,500 pounds, besides the rewards paid by the governor of Virginia pursuant to his proclamation. Please don't. No. All which was divided among the companies of the two ships, Lime and Pearl, that lay in James River. You're very cute, the brave fellows that took them coming in for no more than their dividend clear. amongst the rest, and was paid it within these three months. End of chapter three, part two. Chapter four, part one, section nine of I've heard this guy's voice somewhere else. Pirates, volume I one. Where, yeah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. No, no, no. For more information, we are on Deedles and Pins and, and org. Recording by Mike Harris. Mike Harris. The General History of the Pirates, Volume yeah, 1 by good Charles progress here. Johnson. Chapter 4, Part 1. Of Major Steed Bonnet and his Ah, crew. he's a good one. This is the weirdest a one of them all, I think. In the island of Barbados, he had every advantage. He was master of a plentiful fortune. Apparently got tired of his wife. He had the advantage of a liberal ah, education. Hell with the he had the least pirating. temptation of any man to follow such a course of life. Went from a little the condition crazy, of his circumstances. It was very surprising to everyone to hear of the Major's enterprise in the island where he lived. And as he was generally esteemed and honored, before he broke out into open acts of piracy. Hmm. So he was afterwards rather pitied than condemned by those that were acquainted with him, believing that this humor of yeah, he, going a pirating he went a little crazy. proceeded from a disorder in his mind which had been but too visible in him some time before this wicked undertaking, and which is said to have been occasioned by some discomforts he found in a married state. Aha! Be that as it will, the Women. major was but ill-qualified for the business as not understanding maritime affairs. However, he fitted out a sloop with ten guns and seventy men entirely at his own expense, <laughs> and in the night time sailed from Barbados. He called his sloop Ow! Revenge. His first cruise was off the Capes of Darn Virginia, it. where he took several ships and plundered them of their provisions, clothes, money, ammunition, etc. In particular, the Anne, Captain Montgomery from Glasgow, the Turbot from Barbados, which, for country's sake, after... They had taken out the principal part of the lading. The pirate crew set her on fire. Rude. The Endeavor, Captain Scott from Bristol, and the Young from Leith. From hence they went to New York and off the east end of Long Island, took a sloop bound for the West Indies, after which they stood in and landed some men at Gardner's Island, but in a peaceable manner, and bought provisions for the company's use, which they paid for, and so went off again without molestation. Sometime after, which was in August 1717, Bonnet came off the bar of South Carolina and took a sloop and a brigantine bound in. All oh, right, man. The sloop so belonged to Barbados, right Joseph so Palmer, master laden we with have, rum, uh, sugar, and negroes. have a good start on this line. And the brigantine came from New England, to Thomas Porter, master, whom they plundered, and then dispersed. Wow, look at that. Yeah, but they sailed nice away with the sloop, and had exactly inland North want. Carolina careened by her, and then set her on fire. Back. After the soup had cleaned, right, they got were seen, but going. came to no resolution what course to take. The crew were divided in their right. opinions, and some being for one thing, so and some another, up and so that nothing but confusion seemed to attend all their schemes. Back. The major was no sailor, as was said before, and therefore had been obliged to yield to many things that were imposed on him during their undertaking. 